Good to go. All right. So yes, let's call it to order at 7.03 p.m. And did we have any additions or corrections, deletions to the agenda? No. Seeing none. I'd like to uh, add a, I know this is a long-term planning committee, but uh, something short-term, just a question about the upcoming school year and the corona. Excellent call, Ken. I was going to make. I was thinking the same thing, Ken. Yeah, I'm I'm prepared for that. So that's. <laughs> I knew uh, you would. We could put it at the after food service, so that we got to go through the business and then have a conversation. After food service, okay. Okay, great. All right, moving on to board norms. Uh, we are here obviously to um, uh, do the business and the will of the folks that we serve, the taxpayers, the community, the schools, uh, and do it respectfully. And uh, yeah, so that's it for the norms. And then members of the public, I see quite a few folks here. If there's anything outside of what we have listed on the agenda, uh, kind of now is your time to let us know, uh, and we can speak to it now. If it's if it's something that's part of the agenda and you want to speak to it at that point, that's great. Uh, so let me know if there's anything that you want to speak to outside of the agenda. And I do not see any hands. Anybody else see any hands? No. All right, correspondence. Let me, sorry. So we did have um, two pieces of correspondence. One that actually we already discussed at a, a prior meeting uh, that was from Johanna. And then also uh, we did just get the uh, something from a resident of Jamaica and it was a, another suggestion for how we could potentially uh, look to the long-term planning and it's quite detailed. Uh, and I don't, I'm trying to see if we have the person who put forth this idea on the call. Do not. Yeah, Ella, she's with me. It's my mother. <laughs> okay, I was guessing, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's my mom. All she's right. She's right here with me. I'm sharing a headphone with her. <laughs> well, fantastic. Um, uh, since you, Bonnie, put forth the letter, did you want to speak to it? Did you want to speak to it, Mom? Well, only, only um, when you consider all the options that you give mine some serious consideration to. Probably that would be done at a different meeting. I, I, I'm sorry, I think I caught, uh, you just wanted us to consider this. Uh, as another option. As another option. When you have a plan, another planning committee meeting to go over this, maybe. I could address any questions if anybody had any questions. What I thought. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Bonnie. I really appreciate it. Uh, very well thought out. Did everybody get a chance to to read the letter from Bonnie? And did they have any questions follow up for Bonnie? No, nope. seeing so. none. Um, all right. So. Oh, and Bill is just noting, uh, noting that all docs for tonight are uh, listed here. I believe you probably just put that in. Taking back the reins. <laughs> <laughs> Mom's computer. done, huh? Mom's <laughs> done. <laughs> Great. Um, I didn't know see. when she could propose this plan. I mean, maybe we're a step ahead. You know, we're supposed to do public stuff. September. So 
Well, you know what? Let me um, let me just kind of talk about the bullet points that she has listed here. And, and if there's anything I'm missing, just you know, let me know. Okay. Um, but she does say that one other option potentially would be uh, to leave Leland Gray as uh, six twelve as is for now. Uh, have all fifth graders go to Townsend Grade School, pre middle school. Uh, move the Wyndham Central Supervisor Union office to the Townsend Grade School also, and have all pre K through four go to either Jamaica or Newfane. Uh, that is. Uh, I think she was saying Jamaica and Newfane. Yes. Is what she was. But Townsend. Would get a but Townsend would get a choice, either to go to Newbrook or to Jamaica. Okay. Gotcha. So keep all three elementary schools, just Jamaica and Newbrook would be one through four. Townsend would be grades five, and then they could, you know, Townsend kids could decide to either go to Jamaica or Newbrook, whatever their choice. Okay, got it. All right, thank you. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right, and then the other piece of correspondence we did have um, was from uh, Johanna, who is I just admitted right now, uh, and basic outline of what her letter was was to um, uh, certainly impress upon us that uh, she wanted us to uh, be leaders in the situation and uh, to ensure everyone that uh, Leland and Gray uh, would not be affected by the decisions that we make. Um, in other words, not sending uh, our children to other districts. So just wanted to get that off of the table. And then um, Johanna, as we did last time, is, is there anything that you uh, wanted to comment to on your letter? I think I saw you. Oh, and she is connecting to audio. Please stand by. Or actually, maybe, maybe while we're waiting for her to get online, Bob, would there be anything that you would like to speak to in regards to Joanna's letter, or broadly about Leland and Gray? Uh, always. Um, how much time you got? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Bill had asked me to uh, be ready to do that presentation that I did for the budget committee. Be ready to kind of do that for the whole board if folks want me to. So I'm I. That kind of says most of what I need to say. So if you want that, just let me know. I'm here. If you don't, okay. then that's fine too. Let me know. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. Why don't we hold it until then? Uh, that would be perfect. And sorry, scrolling through. All right. Well, thank you. Those are the two pieces of correspondence. Was there anything else? Did I miss anything? I, I do see that Joe has his hand raised. Yes, sir. Yeah. I just. Um... We got that email from the uh, Development Review Board in Newfane inviting us to the hearing at the end of the month with respect to the property abutting the Newbrook Elementary School becoming a some sort of a being a being bed and breakfast or inn of some sort. Um, it's just that it's just that it's an invitation to attend the hearing, um, which we received because we're an abutter. Um, you know. The officers got it this afternoon. We haven't really decided what to do with it, but you know, there it we did get it. Right, and I think um, all of us agreed that it probably would make sense for some, if not uh, some of us, to attend that meeting. Um, your case made perfect sense, Joe. If you wanted to just kind of explain it. Uh, the notice says if you don't attend the hearing, you have no rights to object to what they decide in the future. So if we want to keep a seat at the table, we're going to have to we're going to have to go and show up. Um, you know, looking at it just myself, I was I was thinking we should probably get the documents and take a look at them, and then you know, depending on what depending on what they say, you know, we may have to throw them by. We may have to toss them by the board's attorney. We may be able to just go to the first hearing, see what's happening, see which way the wind is blowing, and, and then go from there. But keep the keep everybody apprised, I guess. Make sense? Does, absolutely. Go ahead, Keegan. 
I didn't get a copy of the email that you're talking about. So I'm just curious, um, as far as like the meeting goes, is it an in-person setting or is it a, a Zoom remote meeting that they're inviting us to? It's a Zoom hearing. Um, there is a live uh, viewing walk around of the property that they put some social, distanci social distancing protocols in their, in their invitation. And you didn't get the email because it was only sent to Bill on behalf of the board and then he shared it with the officers. Yeah, that's correct. Um, okay, and Bill is just saying he's gonna send it to um, all board members so everybody will have a, have a copy of that. Um, I don't think we need to make any kind of a motion to allow or, or have officers attended. So like Joe said, we'll take a look at the details and then see if, if uh, it is worth, worth us uh, sending somebody or having somebody at the meeting. Sounds like it is. All right, I think that was it for correspondence. Anything else? No, okay. All right, let's move on to the approval of minutes of the June 8th long-term planning meeting. I will entertain a motion. This is Keegan, I make a motion to approve our meeting minutes from June 8th. All right, do I have a second? I'll second it. Thank Ken you, Dana. Me. I'll give it to Dana. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give it back to Ken. <laughs> Dana by a nose. Gets the by second. a nose. <laughs> I second everything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, please respond by either saying A, nay, or abstain. Let's start with you, Joe. Got on mute. Ah, yay. All right, Dana. Yay. Lindsay. Yay. Ken. Yay! <laughs> Emphatic. Keegan. Yay. Mike. Yay. Leanne. Yay. All right, motion carries. And all right, let's see, moving on to old business. Uh, the purpose of the budget committee meetings. I think everybody knows by now that the purpose of the budget committee meetings is to uh, take a uh, conversation offline, put it in the committee, so that they, that committee can dig deep into uh, the budget and uh, bring back any recommendations, actions needed to the full board. Uh, so that, that's really the purpose, to, for a nice deep dive. Uh, the scheduled long-term planning process, I'm through to that, is the next meeting is July 27th, Budget Committee Reviews uh, Cabinet Work, and then August 10th, Board finalizes options and prepares for community presentations. August 24th, Board practices community presentations. And in September and October, the community presentations are put out for feedback. That is the outline for the next months, uh, which uh, we started this process a little while ago. It seemed like a long time from now. It's fast approaching, so yeah. But uh, great work by the budget committee and, and all those uh, involved. And Joe, I do see your hand raised. Thanks. I, I just wanted to add to the whole budget committee purpose in, in the spirit of that deeper dive. Um, be happy to try and uh, work with Lori to have some sort of a, of a uh, cost analysis for, the, for the, uh, the plan that was proposed by the correspondence tonight. Um, you know, some sort of an idea that we can do some of the work up, um, you know, with, with respect to what the tax rate looks like in, in running that configuration so that we can have that actually for the next future planning, you know, in a month. I know it's the end of the year and Lori's kind of straight out, but perhaps by the next budget budget committee meeting, we could have, we could have something. Oh, Lori has appeared. Oh, oh and we I have got a thumbs, thumbs up. up. 
<laughs> Sweet. Thank you, Lori. She was hiding behind a name, but now she has appeared. <laughs> Great. There you go, Joe. Okay. Did anybody else have any other comments on uh, budget committee, long-term planning, et cetera? I knew that we do have uh, some folks here, uh, such as Chris Mays from the paper. If anybody has any questions in regards to this, please, please let us know. And um, we can hopefully answer right now. All right, I am not seeing anything. Okay, so for new business, uh, so this is coming directly from the, uh, this quote is coming directly from the budget committee meeting or about the budget committee. Uh, and this is what happened. So Mr. Foley made a motion for the budget committee to discontinue any options having to do with closing Leland and Gray and also discontinue any options that include constructing a new building. Mr. Clausen uh, provided the second. Mr. Winrick called for a vote on Mr. Foley's motion. Two abstained, one opposed, and three were in favor, and the motion passed. So the budget committee um, made this recommendation to the board, or, I'm sorry, the budget committee will make this recommendation to the board at the next meeting. So that is a direct quote from that meeting. And um, I, will, I would entertain that we could carry over uh, that motion and um, fully enacted. So if, if everyone is in agreement, um, could we have a motion to that regard? Oh, well, it was my motion, so I'll, I'll make my same motion again. All right. I'd be happy to second it this time. Oh, I think Keegan got it. I heard you, Keegan. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we have Mike and then Keegan second. All those in favor say aye, nay, or abstain. Let's start with you, Joe. Oh, sorry, Joe. Joe, I'll give you a second if you want. <laughs> Let's move to Dana. I'm in favor, aye. Oh, I'm sorry, all right, Joe, aye. Okay, Dana. Aye. Lindsay. Aye. Ken. Nay. Keegan. Aye. Mike? Aye. Leanne? Aye. All right, great. Thank you. So we've got one, two, three. Six in favor and one no. The motion carries. All right, thanks everyone. Um, let's move on to Leland and Gray. Future planning. Is this when I call for the great Bob Tebow to perform his presentation as he did at the budget committee? Excellent. I don't know if it's great, Al, but I'll take it. It was fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Um, so do you, if you give me the ability to share. Oh, yeah. Look at that. All right. So everybody can see this okay, I assume? Yes. Yep. All right. So quick outline, and I, this is, there's a lot of words, and so I don't, I'm not interested in reading it all, but I know there's a lot of stuff in here, and I will also share it with Al after, and he can then share it out with you guys, so you can, if you want to take the time to read all the words. Um, but I'll try to do a quick overview um, verbally. So I want to just give you a quick uh, outline of our vision, uh, our mission of the school, what the current experience looks like, in other words, what we have. Um, we, I, I was thinking about this as the conversations around Leland and Gray how are happening. It occurred to me that there's a lot of folks on the board that may not know um, what their high school uh, does and middle school does for kids. And so I figured it'd be good to kind of just do a quick overview of that. We'll talk about the current experience academically from a social emotional standpoint and co-curricular standpoint, talk about a few things that make us unique. Um, and then we'll do the talk about the planning uh, moving forward. So uh, the driving force at Leland Gray is our mission, uh, which is to promote uh, excellence, um, to foster community and to respect individuality. And uh, on each area, I just want to do a quick little summary that uh, students have a pretty wide variety of courses um, at Leland Gray uh, for a small school, plenty of rigorous offerings. 
uh, we offer reasonable class sizes, uh, that, which does promote strong teacher-student relationships. Within the community, our students give of themselves to our community through service learning uh, and through the community support. And the community supports Leland Gray in a wide variety of ways and has done for decades. Um, I, I mentioned this at the, at the meeting at graduation, uh, the week leading up to graduation, uh, one example was we had a local um, businessman uh, who, uh, Larry Gould, who we needed some repair done to some pathways and um, our driveway down on the field, you know, get ready for graduation where he came with a load of gravel, totally free, dumped it off, spread it with a little bobcat and uh, he and a small crew were there working on it and, and told me that, that he was absolutely not charging us and this was a donation to the school. That's the kind, he's an alum, that's the kind of, um, of support we get from our community because of, of, of what the building means to, to those, uh, those folks. Um, conversely, at graduation, I announced the class of 2020 had, which is only, was only 32 graduates, had, um, had, had created over 2000, had, had, had served 2020 um, hours of community service uh, in return to the community, which was kind of cool. They hit it exactly on 2020. Um, so that was kind of cool. So the give and take uh, with our community. Um, and then, of course, individuality. This will be a lot of the, the focus of the future planning piece. The students have the opportunity to personalize their experience through academics, co-curriculars, and through the relationships they create with their peers and staff. So that's a little bit just a quick jump in the mission. Um, as we talk about academics, I just want to highlight a few things. And again, this is the part that's a little wordy, so just bear with me. Um, currently, uh, in our middle school, we offer uh, what you'd expect to be the main four um, core disciplines. Uh, we have middle school students also earning um, high school credit in math uh, and taking classes with their high school uh, cohorts. Um, phys edu physical education, we offer every other day all year. Um, that's six through eight, which is broader than a lot of schools do. Uh, health ed is every other day, uh, so grades seventh and eighth. And in the sixth grade, it's every other day for a semester. Um, band and chorus, obviously art, Chinese, Spanish, uh, library and study skills, technology, personal development in the sixth grade, career exploration in the eighth grade, taught by our, our counseling staff. Um, and of course, uh, what I need block uh, for remediation and enrichment. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the middle school experience that will be this year uh, moving forward. Um, in the high school, uh, we have, the, I didn't list all the normal like high school -y core classes because I figured people kind of know what those are. Uh, but we regularly uh, have been running three AP classes. Uh, others run when the demand requires it. We have teachers that are on, on standby ready to run those. Some of them have run as independent studies, so that's kind of a cool way to do it as well. We have a wide variety of dual enrollment offerings, uh, meteorology, uh, some electives like meteorology, but also some of the, some of the considered like the core classes like Algebra 2 or Pre-Cal. Um, and these are all classes that are taught in-house by our teachers and are, are basically dual licensed through um, either the Community College of Vermont or through one of the universities or state colleges in Vermont as well. So these are all in-house. Um, a wide variety of independent studies. I listed a couple examples that have been done in the last several years. Uh, these, are, these are things that our teachers do outside of their contract of time. Um, and they do these things very willingly, really, uh, as a staff. Uh, because the, they, they want to and because they love the kids. And uh, so there's a wide variety of opportunities for independent studies there as well. We also have, as you guys know, a little bit about our work-based learning opportunities uh, program of, with, that Terry Davison Berger runs. These are just a few of the, um, of the types of settings that our students have been in in the last year or so, um, and all using local businesses, many of which are alumni run, obviously, uh, but kind of a cool program. Um, there as well. And one of the things that also makes us unique is that our high school health curriculum has included a hands-on CPR certification, uh, which is not uh, super common. Uh, I think there's a few in Vermont that do it, but it's not super common. Uh, additionally, we have an online catalog of 80 courses through um, the VTVLC, um, which is sort of like the virtual high school, uh, but it's a Vermont only setup uh, collaboration that we have. Um, and so all the teachers that are teaching those classes are all Vermont licensed which is kind of a, a, a cool addition um, than some of the other online options. Um, additionally, we have a great technology department, art, um, phys ed, world language. Um, these programs offer great 
uh, variety and flexibility. And I'll just give you a quick example of what I mean by that. So for years now, the world language teachers have been doubling up, uh, sometimes tripling up courses uh, in one room at one time. So you might get a Spanish three, four, and five that run concurrently in one room with one teacher with um, you know, a bigger group of kids in order to make that happen. Um, we also have in our technology department, Kevin Burke will take any of the classes that he teaches. Any kid can take it at any time in his room with other students in other classes. So he runs more of a project-based world. So, you know, when you think about a master schedule and classes being assigned, uh, we have the ability to kind of take classes whenever because he's willing to, to offer them in that way. Um, phys ed is also the same at the high school level, great variability happening in that room um, at the same time. And uh, it also happened this year with art for the first time as well, uh, with the exception of ceramics because of the safety stuff around the kiln. Everyone else, uh, those are our classes, painting, drawing, uh, can all happen simultaneously with one teacher in more of a studio type setting. That gives you guys a huge um, efficiency and bang for your buck around staffing. And it gives the kids a much broader access to courses uh, in a small school that they normally might not get because of the schedule, not because we don't offer the courses, but because of the schedule. Um, some offerings that we've had, elective offerings in the English department, there's a couple there listed. In the social studies department, there's a few that are listed there. Um, sciences have their, their share of theirs. We also have um, leadership seminar, woodworking, fine woodworking pro program, our driver's ed program, financial literacy, um, some art classes you can see that are on here. Um, of course, choir, band, including pep and marching bands. So those are, those are things that are, um, you know, in the, in the elective departments, but, but again, a wide variety of offerings. Uh, as you guys know, as you guys passed the policy for proficiency-based graduation a year ago, part of that graduation requirement did include the 40 hours of community service, but it also included um, sort of what I call senior survival 2.0. Um, and this is a, a scaled down version of the old Charlie Marchant senior survival that some of, uh, some of you or maybe some of your parents took, um, but it does hit on some of the main themes um, around how to survive as an adult, uh, the things that are typically not taught in a, in, a, in a traditional classroom. That's a requirement also for seniors to take. And that this, this coming class, 2021, will be the first year that that will be a requirement. Uh, we also offer a project-based learning course, um, which gives the kids dual credit in, um, in, as an English credit, as well as a social science credit combined. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that um, when I talk about the future planning. And of course, for, we also have programming in the special ed world. Uh, with our adventure programming and the home program and our intensive needs ELC program. So a pretty, I would say that having worked at a couple different schools um, over my career and, and knowing what small schools and big schools offer, um, we have an incredible variety of things that we offer our students. Um, and that's, you'll see a little bit more of that in a, in a minute, but it's pretty incredible. On the social emotional front, uh, we support our students to build community. We have a middle school house program, uh, which is like a advisory. Uh, we have a low student counselor ratio. We have resource rooms in the middle and high school. There's our high school advisory program, uh, which Johanna is going to be doing some tweaking of uh, that coming this year as well. Um, the personal development and career course that we talked about in the middle school, spirit activities that we do uh, monthly with the kids. They'll, will obviously look a little bit different this year, um, at least starting off um, in spirit week, the community service requirements, lots of travel opportunities we've no been known for. Obviously that's going to look different too, probably. We have two outside clinicians that come in and meet with kids that we don't pay at all. They come in, they're private employees, contractors that come in. We just give them the space. They build the family separately. Um, so they, they, our kids can access counseling in the building without having to travel to Brattleboro uh, or other places. We have the active food shelf that Chris Parker became very involved with once he was here, which we now were able to expand because of his work. We have a free clothing shop downstairs. Um, uh, we do individual group counseling through our counseling department. Uh, we do have great assembly programming that we've done, and we have some clubs, obviously, that are that many of our kids are engaged with as well, um, in addition to our co-curricular stuff. So lots of different ways for us to ensure that students are uh, have their social and emotional needs met. On the co-curricular side, um, we have in a variety of sports, as you can see, um, uh, ranging from the fall into the spring. Uh, a couple of those are new. Um, but a couple of quick highlights in the last five years, we've had 97 of our kids have earned first or second all team, uh, sec second, first or second team, all MBL, which is the league we were playing in. 
18 that made all state. We had a player of the year in Vermont Four basketball players that played the North South game seniors, same with softball. Uh, we've had 11 coach of the year awards. We've been designated by the reformer as the best coach three different times, made some semifinal trips, some runner ups and a state championship. We've had six individual state champions um, and three new varsity programs, uh, unified basketball, ultimate disc and track and field are all new in the last three years. Uh, and I can tell you personally, on the unified basketball program it is the greatest thing you'll ever see in the world and if you have not had a chance to see it you're missing out on life um and as marty pointed out earlier when he came to some of these meetings that this isn't just about the experience of getting better at a sport obviously it's not even really about the skills very few of our kids are going to go on to play in college and, and and obviously making it to the professional level is, is next to impossible um, but many many memories friendships life lessons that come out of that sports world uh, the same could be said um, in the drama department as well. And for the last 25 years, we've had three shows um, annually. Uh, and depending on the show, and what the show is, the numbers vary. But again, when you have as many as 55 kids involved in a show in a school of under 300 kids, that's pretty impressive. Um, the last two years, they've won awards at the state festival. And they've, including some uh, individual awards have been won as well. And a number of years ago, that we won a Moss Hart Award. Uh, this program will be turned over to a new person this coming year, um, but we expect that tradition to continue. We have very high hopes uh, for him as well. Uh, also in the extracurricular world, our junior Ryan chef uh, has competed at the statewide level. And of course, winter activities, which I know has been a conversation at this board level before, um, we're one of only a small handful of uh, middle and high schools in Vermont that are still doing a winter activities program. And of course, a list of those activities that we participate in um, changes from year to year, but um, always has this roughly the same number of, of different things available. So uh, lots of opportunities for the staff and the students to interact and um, really get to see staff in a different way as, when that's happening. All right, so now getting into the future planning piece. Um, the first thing that I would say is that, you know, the, the COVID experience, we all have had opportunities to kind of reflect on uh, how that has made us better at what we do. Uh, because of the challenges that have, that have come from that experience. Um, and a, a couple of topics just to throw out there. So under the area of instruction, uh, we've learned now that we are better equipped to leverage technology for better instruction. So uh, whether you're trying to differentiate lessons for kids, um, now that all students are pretty, or all students, all teachers are pretty proficient with Google Classroom and some of those tools, um, they are now really well positioned to use those tools to improve their instruction, um, even in regular times, which we don't know if that will exist right away or not. Uh, we learned a lot of challenges around students with their executive functioning skills um, and having those lacking. And as I mentioned, the reference Johanna and the advisory um, overhaul that she's working on, this is a big chunk of that as well. Um, and making sure that we are teaching kids really deliberately how to stay organized, how to um, uh, do reading strategies, different things that will help them be better students in all, in all areas. Um, so that's one area that we, we noticed that the, the kids that had the gaps there um, really, really struggled. Um, and then of course, this, this, the thinking of this gave us new, new opportunities. So again, the idea of leveraging technology to get more, more variability within the course. So, you know, currently we, we don't really run a lot of, um, we don't really hardly run any, leveled classes. Everything is pretty um, heterogeneous and the exception of some of the upper level math classes. But using leveraging technology, we have the ability now to use Google Classroom to create honors tracks for our students in the same room um, with the rest of the students. So they're physically, they're not being tracked away from other kids, but they get to have access to potentially more rigorous opportunities uh, through using this. And our teachers are pretty excited about this, this uh, idea and we'll be digging into more of that as we go on. And of course, there were challenges. Um, we do know that our vulnerable populations have gaps that were already existing, and those are getting larger. And that's something that I think everyone's pretty aware of um, in the ed education world. And we have to figure out how to how to really, you know, close those gaps. So that brings us to sort of what's next for us and what we're thinking about. Uh, my vision is that we are going to be the best small school in Vermont, hands down. And um, that that's my goal. It's, that's really why I'm here. Um, that's why I left a, a different high school to come to this place because I really believe in the, in the incredible potential that Leland Gray has. And I hope I've been able to articulate that to you guys over the last couple of years. Um, small makes us more personal. 
Um, it, it gives us much more easily able to change and adapt to things. You know, uh, just a quick story of how over that weekend in March where we all went to um, distance learning, a lot of districts really took a week or more to really fumble with and struggle with that process of change. And there's lots of reasons for that and they're all legitimate. Um, I'm very proud to say that our staff turned over in a couple of days and was able to, to offer some pretty high quality stuff uh, pretty quickly. And that's just because we're small, we're able to do that. And, and the staff is amazing, of course. Um, and because we're small and because we're able to adapt and change, we're able to really offer personalized education for all of our kids. Um, it, you shouldn't, you're not a number at Leland Gray. You're a person and everyone knows you and you know everybody. And it's, um, it is one of the, the great benefits of, of uh, a small school. So my pitch to you guys has always been this, uh, the smallest reviewed as a blessing, not a curse. It can be more expensive for sure. I get that. I was a principal of a larger high school. I understand the efficiencies of scale that you get in a bigger place. Um, but there's many things that you lose in a bigger place as well. And I think those things have been articulated through Johanna's letter. Marty certainly talked about it early on what our kids would or would not be able to access if Leland Gray did not exist. And we were busing them and twisting them to Brad Road to Burn Burden. Many of our kids wouldn't even make teams. They wouldn't make the, the, the you know, the, the lead roles in drama. They wouldn't make, um, you know, first chair clarinet or whatever that, whatever that thing is that they're striving for. It would be much harder for them to compete um, because the pool is that much bigger. And on top of that, the added um, travel distance and how that would impact the family's willingness to allow them to try to compete and what that meant for families in the pool. So I thank you for the motion you made prior uh, because I think you have, you have really solidified um, a, a good vision for the kids of the West River Valley for years to come. And I think that's something you should be proud of. Um, a lot of people talk about personalization and I know I'm going super fast through this, but I want to give you guys a couple of examples because typically as board members or lay folk, you don't really have a pretty good sense of what that can look like. Um, Keegan probably has a little better view of that um, as a teacher, but this, this is a, just a couple of quick snapshots of, of what it could look like. So I, I have five different student scenarios here. Um, this is a student who through their early middle school years decide they like animals. They are considering a career as a vet tech, maybe a full veterinarian, they're not really sure. What I've done here is I've tried to lay out in chart form. The first column is courses that we have. These are existing courses that we offer on a regular basis um, that kids take. So this student could jump into a couple of science classes that are really designated to help train them for that career. We have work-based learning program. We have a vet clinic down the street. We have Grace Cottage. Um, so they could really explore some medical careers there. They could do, when we've had an independent study on animal A&P. Uh, that's been done before. Um, we could access a CCV course through the voucher system. Um, and I just happen to find one called animal behavior. They could do a winter activity at Girders um, in the rescue, working with, uh, working with animals. And they could do their community service hours at the Humane Society. So lots of ways to kind of like tailor your experience. Um, in this case, yes, you leave the building, but you never leave the West River Valley to do this. You, if the CCV class is online, you have not left the valley to do this. Um, so imagine the other things you could add on if they were additionally going further. But this is just within our community, which I think is super cool. Uh, student number two, really into the computer world. They are leaning towards a computer science, possibly college bound. Uh, we have some programming and applied technology program through Kevin Burke's uh, setup. We have work-based learning opportunities through IT departments. Uh, we have independent studies and networking, CCV classes you could take. Uh, Terry's worked hard on building alumni connection with kids, with alum who are in careers to try to find connections for our kids to talk to about what they want to do and how they go about it. And they could use their community service hours to build teacher websites. Um, really lots of opportunities in that, in that realm. Uh, student three, I like money, right? That's a popular one with kids. Uh, they want to consider business or finance. We have some courses that will lead, help lead them in that direction. Um, we have students that have actually done uh, internships with Lori down at the uh, Wyndham Central Office. Uh, and of course, there's lots of VTVLC courses and CCV courses they could access. They could be involved in yearbook. They could do community service hours up in Jamaica, helping out with bingo. They could run for office as a treasurer of the student council. So lots of ways to really personalize that experience. Um, law enforcement, same thing. I mean, you, get, you guys get the idea of, of where I'm getting at here. You're kind of highlighting courses that we already have that when you pair them together or partner them together with some other options through online 
um, and work-based learning and other opportunities they can create for themselves a pretty good, pretty good uh, track towards a career. Um, and uh, this one I thought it was based on a kid that just graduated actually, who um, we announced at graduation, he was starting his own business. Um, and so he had really been working with Terrier for quite a while on that and had worked with the BDCC in developing a business plan, the whole nine yards. Um, and so again, lots of opportunities to, to uh, do these kinds of learning opportunities for him. Um, so again, those are super quick and it feels like I'm sure I rushed through a lot of them. Um, I do want you to know that despite the fact that these are all Elon and Gray programs, of course, we also have students that access the Wyndham Regional Career Center and can access the programs and the career track down there as well. So that is another thing that, that uh, some of our students do. So, and you could pair and mix all of this together to create a pretty good career track. Um, when we, when we rolled out the, the senior survival course uh, to you guys last year, one of the things I talked about was ensuring that every kid when they graduate has, has either been accepted to and is planning to attend a college, has a job that we have helped them achieve, whether it's through resume building or interview training or what have you, um, that we can say at graduation with certainty that we know what every single kid is doing. 100% placement in society. And that was really the goal of what a high school is all about. And um, you know, this year's senior class was small with 32, but we did at graduation, for those of you that were there, we did say what each kid was doing and uh, where they were going. And it was very cool, it was very personal, and uh, folks really appreciated that. So that's the presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have along the way as well. I'm happy to not speak again for a while, whatever you guys, whatever your pleasure is. Bob, I will reiterate, that was a great presentation. Uh, Leland and Gray, the little school that could, something for everyone. So uh, really appreciate it. I did see um, the first hand that we had up was Chris Jurgers. Uh, oh, and actually she is, she is saying that the question is to the board, uh, not to Bob, but uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris, with your question. Sure. Okay. Um, so Bob, thank you. I had two sons that went through Leland and Gray, um, and they loved it. Um, as an educator in the district, um, and as the board is deciding to, um, change what our elementary schools look like now that you've taken Leland and Gray off the table. I guess I'm asking the board to offer the same um, experience that you just received with Bob with our other principals so you can see what the full look like is at each of our in individual elementary schools um, to talk about their successes, what's next, um, et cetera, prior to making any decision. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. That's, that's a fantastic idea. Bill, can we do that? Get them together? All right. Great idea. It's fantastic. All right, I think I've got Keegan and then I see Ken. Bob, I gotta tell you, your presentation was amazing. And the offerings that the kids of Leland and Gray, the, the opportunities that the staff and faculty have created and provided for them is truly, I mean, as a teacher, it's amazing. Um, and I love how you're able to draw, like help the kids see these connections between a passion and seeing it through to a profession and creating, I love the, your phrase where they, you can guarantee a hundred percent placement in society. Like I, I really appreciate that, that all encompassing approach where not every kid is going to go to college, but every kid should have those opportunities to pursue the passions that they have. So I'm, 100% team Leland and Gray. Like, this is amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I just say that I think the, the role of high schools has always been to prepare kids for what's beyond, but the focus is often on college. And the reality is, even the ones that go to college end up in a career. So, like, really, what we should be talking about is career planning. And maybe there's an avenue to college, maybe there's not, but that, that puts us in that position of preparing them for adulthood and society. Bravo. Well done. Great work. Thank you. Thanks, Keegan. Ken, and then Lindsay. Uh, I was just, Bob, great presentation. It piggybacked off of the last one, which, you know, reiterating, a little, you got a lot, little more points in there this time. And for Chris Jurors, thank you very much for that suggestion. If you didn't make it, I was going to, because there's a lot of unique uh, opportunities at our elementary schools also. 
So thank you uh, both. Absolutely. Thanks, Ken. Lindsay? Sorry, I was having muting trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to um, say, as somebody who has gone through Leland and Gray, um, that we purposely moved here so that my kids could go to Leland and Gray. Like, that's literally why we moved here. Um, and I know that we're not alone. <laughs> um, so, you know, it is a little school, and I think that's amazing. And I think it's everything about what I loved about going to school there, because everybody can be a part of everything. And um, because it's a smaller environment, everybody can be friends with everybody. Um, and there's a lot, I just feel like there's a lot of huge, huge benefit to being in a small high school like that. So um, I know we talk a lot about the negatives of it being little and how hard that is financially for the community to support. But I think that the bang for your buck is a lot more than um, a lot of people realize. And I will just say this, I think having been one of Lindsay's and Leanne's teachers, um, part of the, that, part of the idea of knowing people well, I don't know, how many times each of you guys had me, but I would I guarantee it was probably at least twice, potentially four times. And by the time you're a senior, three times, uh, by the time you're a senior, like you, you have that person multiple times, like we really know the kids, you know, we know the kids and the kids really talk about that relationship that they have with the staff and they love their teachers. It's really a, a pretty cool thing that you see, so. Thanks, Bob, thanks, Lindsay. And next we have Emily. Uh, thanks. Sorry for being late. Um, always on meetings. Uh, I just wanted to sort of echo what Lindsay was saying. And while we aren't from the same generation, I am also a graduate of Leland and Gray, as most of you know. And my kids are also graduates of Leland and Gray. And again, echoing Lindsay, we moved back to Newfane so that our kids could go to Leland and Gray because of the positive experience. And so I just <laughs> wanted to say this goes on for generations. And I'm, you know, thrilled. Bob, thank you. That was a fantastic presentation. I'm glad I was able to make most of it. And, um, you know, I think that I, we have a great school. And for all the reasons that everyone else was talking um, about, I'm thrilled that we're still here and we need to fight for us. So thank you. Thanks, Emily. Anybody else? And Chris says, please don't forget you have great schools. Yes, of course. Absolutely. All of our schools. Fantastic. Um, well, everybody else has done a testimony. I will as well. I, uh, <laughs> the Claussen household is fully invested in Leland and Gray. And we have also had, um, at this point, one, two, three kids who have gone to Leland and Gray, one coming in sixth grade. And somebody that's been there for, I think, the longest tenured of any employee at Leland and Gray. Uh, she probably shoot me for saying that. But uh, yeah, so we are, we are also fully invested in, in a great presentation and uh, go Leland and Gray, go Rebels. And Al, it's really hard to be the longest lasting teacher when you're only 29 too, so I don't know. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, it's magic, dog years, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Bob. Does anybody else have any questions, comments for Bob? All right. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Moving on to the draft survey for Leland and Gray students, past students, high school students, as well as the draft survey for the community. Uh, did everybody get a chance to take a look at those? And Bill, did you want to comment to that? I yeah, um, on the first one, the survey for the Leland and Gray students passed. I'm going to work with uh, Terry Davidson Berger uh, to get that out so that we can, uh, you know, work on our continuous improvement, find out the things um, from our students that have worked really well, things that they might have found challenging, um, and then, uh, you know, get those results to the board so that you guys can have a continuous improvement process 
you guys were particularly interested in going a little bit deeper than the climate survey. So that's why that one was developed. So um, just wanted to keep you informed. We're gonna move forward with that. Uh, the second one's a little bit more um, important for you guys to uh, consider uh, the wording and the, and the questions. Um, is there possible for someone to pull that up? Maybe Joe is really good at this stuff. But before Joe does that, or Al, as they're battling to do it, um, what we discussed at the budget committee meeting is possibly the best time to distribute this survey would be to do this at the uh, primary in, on August 11th. And I've spoken with the town clerks and we would run it kind of like the Doyle survey where we would provide the survey to all the towns. We would have our own collection box. Um, they would cr create a space for um, the citizens that come to vote to do that. Um, also, if you guys approve tonight, I can get it to them this week and then they can include it with any time they mail out a um, absentee ballot or somebody picks up an absentee ballot. Um, but basically this survey is the board's wishes to get some feedback from the community and in particular our voters who are voting on our budgets. And so we had our original um, survey that uh, we shared at the budget committee and we took um, feedback from the board and then made some edits and what you see in front of you and what you've had a chance to review for the last three or four days is um, what we are seeing if you guys are comfortable having be available on August 11th. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I see that Mike has his hand raised. Sure. Um, Bill actually kind of touched on it with the absentee ballots. I heard from a voter today who already has her absentee ballot. So she's wanting to know how the people who already have their ballots are how they're going to be able to answer this survey. It's a good question. Um, they'll be at the town clerk's office. So I guess they're probably the easiest and cleanest way would be for if you live in Townsend and you've already done your absentee ballot um, for us to communicate out that you can get them still at the town clerk's office so that everybody's always going through the election official. Um, that's just off the top of my head. I almost wonder if, there's a, if there could be a link where they could download it for somebody who's already at home and already has their ballot, if they could download it and then return it with their ballot. What about that? Yeah, we could definitely do that. I don't think we're going to have a lot of ballot stuffing for this particular. No, <laughs> no, me uh, neither. But yeah, no, no, we could, we could definitely do that. And then uh, if somebody contacts a board member or myself, we could point them to that link the link and then they can just return yeah. it to the town clerk. Sounds yeah, good. Okay, thanks Mike. I see Ken and then Emily. Okay, I just have a question uh, on, on the survey. It says here, uh, are you an employee of Wyndham Central or the WRMED? Why would that be relevant? We took, when we discussed this at the um, Budget committee, it was uh, taking it from the mission of the board when you guys talk about stakeholders. We weren't clear if you guys had responding to stakeholders were your uh, employees as well as your um, voters and your citizens. Um, again, this is the board survey, so you guys need to decide. But that's where it came from, Ken. Uh, okay, because my, 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 my thought here is, uh, it should be irrelevant if the person works or doesn't work in the district, being there a stakeholder as a voter, period. So it's kind of like asking an irrelevant question, if you ask me. It's like, you know, um, I, that, yeah. I, I, you know what I mean? Right. That level of detail is unnecessary because if they're already getting it to vote, they're already indicating that they are a voter and a citizen. Correct. I, that, that makes an awful lot of sense to me, but I didn't want to make any, I wanted to add things based on the budget committee. I didn't want to take anything away until you guys had this conversation. Um, I'm, I'm going to- Keegan, sorry, I apologize. Sorry. Uh, em Emily first and then- uh, 
Yeah, I just wanted to sort of echo about the concerns about there, there has been an unprecedented number of people requesting absentee ballots already and quite a number of folks who are voting actually already. So let's try to make this, if we're going to link it to the ballot, that's great to figure out how to link it through the ballots that are being mailed in. But we need to do better than that because we'll miss a lot of folks otherwise because there are a lot of people who are voting early. And so let's make it available in whatever way we possibly can, because the key to this survey, regardless of what we add or don't add to it, is the number of people who respond. And we, we should really think very carefully about how we can get that out there to our communities. So that's just a thought on it. Thanks, Emily. Uh, Keegan and then Lindsay. Um, I was just thinking in response to Ken's thought about the, the question regarding um, employment status as being irrelevant. I would almost, I, I think that, that it might feel like extra detail, but I think it's an important question to ask because you're, you're only getting to know a little bit more about who your voters are, who your constituents are, and if they happen to be working in the building that we're making decisions about, I, I think that that matters, or at least to have that, that degree of awareness. Um, but that's just me. Keegan, just to follow up, are you, are you saying that we want to kind of try to eliminate any kind of bias uh, or, or disseminate the two so we have taxpayers that uh, may not necessarily have anything to do with Wyndham Central Supervisory or WRMED? Is that what you're I'm saying that I think it's a fair, I, I think it's a fair question to okay. ask, are you an employee of Wyndham Central Supervisor Union or WRMED? Gotcha. Because even, even as a teacher or a custodian or a coach, um, you're a stakeholder beyond just being a voter, you know? So we aren't keeping track of who's voting and, and who, how individual voters are, are feeling it kind of just adds to like this whole collective. I think it speaks to the data that you can collect and, and you can learn more about your community. So of X number of returned ballots, 15 were employed by either the supervisory union or the school district. You know, Great. That's just the point I was making. I wouldn't okay. throw it out just because it, it seems like a, a useless question. It, it's not. Thanks for the clarification, Keegan. Appreciate it. Uh, Lindsay and then Ken. Um, I also feel like it's not a question worth throwing out. I think that that's actually um, good to have all the information. We've heard from a lot of um, several, anyway, um, staff members of the supervisory union um, and their um, thoughts and feelings are just as important um, as all the other stakeholders. But I would love to have um, some, I, I really desperately want to reach those really hard to reach people, which are probably not supervisory union employees. And so I don't think it um, takes anything away from a supervisory union employee to have answered this, but I would very much love to know, are you not? I mean, you could even ask that question if you'd rather. Those are the people I most want to like, make sure we hear from, because um, we haven't heard from a ton. So um, that was one part. And then I also wanted to say regarding the survey outreach, because I think it's so important to reach out to those other folks, is it possible to do, um, you were talking about having it something that we could download. Is it possible that maybe we are sharing this on like Front Porch Forum or other local places and then people can click the link and fill out the survey and we can just spread this like crazy to everybody. We can forward it to everybody we know and say, please fill this out, do me a favor. We'd love to hear what you have to say. Um, and, and all the places that something that's really easy to forward around. That's my thoughts. Thanks. Thanks, Lindsay. Great idea. Ken, back to you. Okay, in response to that, I'm glad that everybody thinks it's a great idea. My problem is <laughs> at the WCSU level, uh, we've had this come up where if, for example, 
if there's only four kids on IEPs in a town and the cost for special education goes up, those people are being singled out. If you only have so many employees in a certain town and uh, they state their opinion open and freely and uh, in the voting process, it's supposed to be uh, how you vote is behind the curtain your business. If you're singling out and, and we look at this and we go, oh, let's see, 14 teachers voted that uh, lower my taxes are more important. So if 14 teachers voted that, we, ha we can argue with the uh, NEA over a smaller salary increase this year because they want their taxes lower. You can't single out a certain group by asking a question like that. We've had this problem before with, with our students, so, but now we're doing it to our employees, I feel, that it's kind of singling them out. And, you know, it's like, what difference does it make if you work there or not, which you rate is higher? It shouldn't make a difference that you work for the WCSU or the uh, Newbrook Elementary or Leland and Gray. It shouldn't make a difference where you work. We have another... <laughs> We have a teacher from another district here. She's going to fill out the application. She's going to fill out the same questionnaire. She's a teacher, but not in our district, but she still pays taxes. So what difference? She's only getting one. She's only getting one questionnaire. She's not going to get another one from work. So what difference does it make? It should not make a difference. It should not even be on there if they're an employee or not, because all you're doing, unless you're going to gauge the employee data separately, you're discriminating or coercing by saying, you work for us, we're taking this survey, we want to know, you know, do you value your job? Because pretty much it could impact somebody's job. I would think by asking every, every employee, um, you know, let's face it, you're not going to get a high school teacher to say, uh, no, I want to close Lee Lynn and Gray. You're not going to get an elementary school to say, an elementary school teacher to say, or, or administrator to say, yeah, you know what? Yeah, let's close down uh, some of the elementary schools and consolidate. Okay. It's folly. It's folly to even. Great. I, Ken, I think we got your point. Uh, I'm going to move on to, we've got Leanne, Keegan, and then Mike. Unmuted. Um, I don't have a problem really with that question being in there as far as the employment. Um, it's a survey. People can complete all of the survey. They can complete part of the survey. There's nothing compelling anyone to even have to answer that question. If an employee wants to complete it but is uncomfortable marking that they're an employee, leave it blank. Great. Thanks, Leanne. Keegan? Um, same point as Leanne, but I would actually ask our elected official, um, what does Emily Long think about this? Do you see that this asking a question about, you know, there's no name collection, and I would, I would argue that there's enough registered voters in our communities that you could not, without actual tons and tons of effort sleuthing, figure out who signed up for which which things. So I'm, I would love to hear what Emily thinks. I don't see it being an issue. But. Emily? I'm happy to respond as a sure. school board member. And I think the critical point of any survey is that it is anonymous. And, you know, people can, as, as Leanne said very clearly, people can fill it out in whatever way they want. I don't see any challenge around this and I think it it actually could be useful information it's not um, yeah I, I don't I don't see any issue with it whatsoever being as a part of this I'm speaking I, I will say I appreciate your question 
Keegan as a elected official, but we're all elected officials and I'm here as a school board member and my response is as a school board member. Thanks. Mike? Uh, yeah, I just kind of was thinking along the same lines. Um, it might have been different back a few years ago when a school district was one school, right? And then you might be able to say, well, geez, we got 12 people in this school that answered this as employees. Maybe you could glean something more from it that way. But it, right now, I mean, somebody answers that question, yes, they could be an SLP that works in four, you know, three, four different buildings, you know? Like you, you really can't tie it back to, you know, uh, one school position. Um, so I, I don't have a problem with it. And then like Leanne said, they can choose to ignore that one question and their answers would still get counted. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Leanne, is that a hand up again or? <laughs> Not putting you on the spot. Just forgot to put it down, Al. Okay. <laughs> All right. And let's see, I do see Ken's hand. Go ahead, Ken. Okay, as long as nobody else is going to say anything. Uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, if we're not going to use this data separately, what relevance does it have to do with the survey? That's my question. Is And if somebody decides, if, if you're going to say, oh, well, we had uh, – 34 employees fill it out and suppose somebody, if somebody answer, doesn't answer yes or no, obviously they're not going to be not an employee and chose not to, you know, and I, I, so I don't understand what the relevance of this is even doing in the survey, unless you're going to say, well, all the staff members that answered the survey said, and <laughs> what weight does that actually put on the survey? That's my question. It's a completely irrelevant question to the future of the district. So I don't understand why, what leverage does this question have to guide this board? Other than, yay, all our, uh, our, our all, all, all our staff are going out and using the right to vote, which I'm all for that because they all should be. But by them taking this survey and saying, yes, I work there, if it's not going to be separate information and be calculated separately, that question, other than, yes, they're an employee there and we don't care how they answered because we're going by the majority of survey takers. So what is the relevance of even asking the question is my point. Okay, great. Thanks, unless, you're gonna, unless you're going to single out a, a, the, the staff surveys and say, oh, we're only going to listen to the staff and throw all the voters stuff away. I don't know what's going to happen with it. Right. Okay. You I think we get your point. So why, so why are you earmarking certain? certain okay. I, I, think, I think many others have laid out the argument for so. I'm just gonna, uh, no, they, no, I all see they a few other hands raised, so I'm going to continue to move the argument. I think we have your point. Not answer yes or no. It's not what. What is what is the somebody give me an answer to how this information is okay, going can, to so move have, the district forward? Can somebody? We have three other people with their hands up. So let's see if we get. All right, that. I'm asking. Can somebody answer Great. that question? Okay. Bill, can you let's, answer let's that go question? To, let's go to Emily, Mike, and then Joe. Well, maybe I can um, help you out because my question was, Ken, maybe I can help you out. My question was going to be, there, there is no doubt in my mind that there was a lot of thought and effort put into this survey by um, a committee that worked really hard to get the language in here correctly. So um, I, I would just ask if anyone on the committee wants to say why it was included in there. I, again, I don't have a problem with it being included there. I don't see it as a negative in any way. But uh, you know, it might be nice to hear from committee members who, who actually included this question. So, thanks, Emily, Mike, and then Joe. Uh, I mean, I, I think that employees are just another of the interested parties, right? So it it might be interesting to me to see 
wow, of all the people that answered that they are employees, you know, 80% of them felt this way about this one issue, you know, like, not that we're going to weight those responses higher. I think we're going to take the, whatever the highest responses are. Um, and, but it, it might, it might just give us an extra point, a data point to look at uh, and to consider, um, which might, you know, help us come up with the right answer here. Thanks, so. Mike. And Joe. Yeah, Mike captured it perfectly. It's another data point. It can, I mean, if, if the staff answers much differently than some of the others, um, it, it does provide us additional information. Not to, penal, not to penalize the staff, but for, for us to you know, know what's important to a, a smaller group of our constituents, the, the, the you know, boots on the ground, if you will. Um, I'll also make a motion to just go forward with this survey. I think everybody's spoken to this thing at least once. Um, I, I'd, I'd make a motion and let it go. I'll second that. All right, any final discussion? Are there any other aspects of the, this that we need to talk about? I see Bill's, <laughs> all right, we got Bill and then Dana and Joe, did you raise your hand again? No, <laughs> Bill and then Dana. Oh, I just wanna point out that at the bottom, uh, we would pick one of the options, option one or option two. We wanna, you know what I mean? Depending on the motion you guys made earlier, I would suggest you would amend it to option one or, yeah. or two. That, that was it. Thanks, Bill. Joe, would you like to amend that? Sure. Um, I'll amend it to go with option one. Joe, if you amend it to go with option one, it introduces the closing of Leland and Gray. And oh, right. Option one, option one has a building construction, which we, right. It would have to be option two. I'm sorry. Thank you. Can I apologize? Who was the second on? Mike was. I was. Mike. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, and Dana, sorry. Yeah, I was going to bring up the thing about the options, but uh, I was kind of wondering, do you want to know if the taxpayers in the, out there want to close Loan and Gray or build a new building? Do you want to leave option one open? Or do we just want to shut our ears to that? Well, we have a motion on the floor. Good question. Uh, of course, there is the option of other. Please describe below so they can certainly put that in there as well. All right, I see some more hands. I've got Ken and then Mike. I would uh, suggest that uh, whoever or Joe made the motion to amend it to option two. I believe that's what originally uh, the purpose of the survey was to get to find out exactly uh, which that these if these options were important to uh, the taxpayers. These were the options. This 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 is why one of the main reasons this survey was made. And now you're just going to eliminate it. He did amend it to option two, but option two is maybe not the one you're thinking of. I mean, option one, I mean, back to option one, because that's the, re that's the reason why we, uh, the main, one of the main reasons we did the survey was to get a feel from the taxpayers if they wanted to go that route. Okay. And quite, on quite honestly, uh, we were going to wait to get to the COVID thing. And I'm just going to point out now, do you want to consolidate anything right now and put more kids in one building? <laughs> That's for the whole board to think about. Let's get real here, people. 
but right. I won't say any more on that till we get to that uh, part. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Yes, we're working on this motion. All right, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so um, I mean, option two is more in line with what the budget committee and what we talked about tonight again. Um, and I do want to hear from the community. I think we all do, you know. Um, in, um, for me, what I've been hearing is I didn't hear any real support for closing LNG and I didn't hear any real support for building a new building, which is why I was hoping to kind of move us further down the road because like Al said earlier, we don't have a lot of time. Um, these weeks are going by faster now that it's summer and um, you know, that's, that was my reasoning for making the motion, you know. Um, uh, and I, I think op option two is where our public is. But again, I, I mean, don't take my word for it. I'm just one board member, but that, that is where I believe our public is. But I mean, the data will confirm that, I guess, or not. All right, thanks, Mike. All right, well, I don't see any more hands, so let's, let's call it. Uh, all those in fi favor, say a, uh, nay, or abstain. Roll call. Roll call, yes. All right, let's start with Dana. Nay. Lindsay. Yay. Leanne. Nay. Sorry, didn't catch that? Yay. Thank you. Joe? Yay. Egan. Yay. Emily. Yes. Mike. Yay. And I believe I see Trish. Abstain. Abstain. Okay. All right. Did we get the count on that bill? Did you miss Ken? Oh, up. Jeez. Ken. Oh, you're you're muted, Ken. Thank you. I was wondering. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, and this is option. Which option again? Two. Option two. It was amended to option two. Okay, it was amended to option two. Okay, I didn't hear any movement for a friendly, uh, but whatever. Uh, I'm still voting nay because. Okay. Thank you, uh, Bill. What's yeah. the count? Dana, were you a yay or a nay? I think he was a nay. I was a nay. Okay, so Thanks, I got man. seven, two, one. Two, one. Great. Thanks, Bill. Motion carries. And so that will Be distributed at the August 11th primary vote and in all the other capacities that we discussed. All right, appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, moving on to the FY22 models for running a local pre-K to 12 system. Do we have a guest speaker? <laughs> there she is again. Hi, Lori. Good morning, everyone. Okay, did everybody have a chance to look this over? It's a lot of uh, data, but I'm gonna run through it for you tonight. Uh, just to kind of back up and talk about um, the budget committee, uh, you know, as we've all been hearing, voted to pursue the top grid there, um, the one, two, three, four, five scenarios and uh, or pathways. So we're gonna go through those tonight. Um, the first one, zero, is the current operations as presented. Uh, so we know where we are right now and then where are we headed. Hey, Lori, sorry for the interruption. Do we wanna uh, pull these up and present them? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Right. Joe, would you be able to share that? Yeah, I'm pulling it up now. Great. Right. Awesome. And while Joe's doing that, I'll just, you know, the driving question um, at the top sort of sets the stage for the, the whole presentation, which is what is the best way to reset the tax rate while providing a high quality education for all students? Okay. Is the fan in the background too much noise? Does everybody, can you hear me all right? Okay.
Oh, thought it was coming up. So while Joe's pulling these up, I'll just go through the different options <laughs> that we're going to review. Um, so we've got the current operations, and then we also, the, the uh, budget committee uh, <clears throat> suggested and asked for a, what, it, what is the floor? What is the lowest the tax rate could be? Which is a basically a non-operational um, situation where you don't have, any, all of the students are tuitioned out to other schools. So you don't operate any uh, schools. All right, great, thank you, Joe. If you wanna just push it up a little bit, we'll talk through the options. Okay, and then, oh, that, they're in color, I don't have them in color, okay. Um, and then the uh, number one was the fiscal year 22 through 25 with the assumptions, and what does that look like? Um, and where, where would you be by fiscal year 25 if nothing changed and we applied the, all the same assumptions? Um, then number three was the three locations, uh, having two elementary schools and one mid-high school. And the number 11 is having one uh, elementary and one mid-high. And the the grade configuration would be different. So let's go ahead and dive in. We go down to um, the deeper dive. Okay, so now we're, this is the non-operational modeling. So I'm gonna talk through this. Um, the tuition rates, that I used were average tuition rates for pre-K, primary, and secondary. Uh, and, you know, some of those are close to the statewide average, like the elementary would be pretty close to the statewide average there. Um, it is including transportation, uh, which is provided at the current level that you provide now. Um, I know, I think there was one suggestion that we didn't add transportation, but there is also a grant attached to the transportation, so it really doesn't change the tax rate by very much when you take it out um, because of the grant. It also includes special education assumptions, and this is where it gets a little bit complicated um, when you are basically you have no control over your special education costs at this point, right? All of your students are tuitioned out to different um, schools and they are being educated by the special educators at that school. Um, when that happens, uh, they typically charge an excess cost. Excess cost is over and above the regular tuition. So if your tuition um, for a primary school student is $15,000, you know, you're gonna pay that. But if they are on an IEP and they receive services, you might get charged in what we call an excess cost to cover those um, expenses at the school where you're sending them to. Um, this is an average. It's, it can be, um, you know, as high as, um, $25,000 and it could be as low as, you know, 3,500, depending on what the services are. So I used um, this average um, for every special ed student that we have. Um, and then the board expenses don't go away in this um, scenario, uh, which includes the, the SU assessment and the debt does not go away as well. You need to pay your debt um, that is current right now. So, you know, as we're looking down through, it's very interesting to, to look at this, right? So you're, you're saving $1.6 million in expenses, which, you know, seems like it should really drop the tax rate by quite a bit. But you have to remember that the offsetting revenue is also being reduced. Um, and mainly that's, you know, you're not taking in tuition students, you're not getting any grants any small schools grants, any type of, uh, there, there are several high school type grants that you would, uh, that are 
included in the um, fiscal year 21 offsetting revenue right now. So, you know, your offsetting revenue drops by um, 1 million. So the net is about $600,000 um, when you drop down through. <clears throat> Keeping the same equalized pupils, um, because you still count all of your pupils no matter where they go. Uh, you know, it reduces your cost per pupil down by, you know, $1,000 here. Whoops, I'm trying to make it go up <laughs> with my mouse. So you want to just scroll up, Joe, that would be great. So the interesting part when I ran these numbers, which is, you know, always when you run it through the calculations, um, is, is it actually doesn't get rid of the penalty, believe it or not. Almost, but, you know, not quite. And I'm not exactly sure how exclusions play into it. Um, there would be some exclusions because you have the debt still, uh, but some of the other exclusions might not apply. So um, I left the exclusions the same though. So uh, the floor is $1.83 is where this comes out. Does anybody have any questions on the non-operational details? Laurie, I've got a question. This is Keegan. Yep. And I, I might have missed it or you may not have talked about it or I got excited and started thinking about something else. Okay. Um, within this model that you're talking about and the the is this to like just close everything? Is, yes. is that what this yes. not? Okay. So this isn't a model that would then use a vacant building as the, as like a new target program location. That's not what this is about. No. Oh. Thank you. You're welcome. Dina, I saw your hand. You took it down. You're, you're good. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. And then Mike and Joe. I just want to point out that if we can't tuition all of our students, like if we took this and tuitioned all of our students and we still don't remove the penalty, um, that comes back to the waiting study to me. Um, you know, we, we've got to start putting pressure on our legislators. Sorry, Emily, um, <laughs> to address this issue. We can't even tuition our kids and not get the penalty. That is shocking quite honestly. It, it was surprising to me too. I mean, you know, there are numbers like the special ed is such a variable, really. It's very hard when you're doing a non-operational school to, um, to predict the special education needs. Um, so, you know, it could be lower than that, but yes, at where I have it right now, there is still a penalty. Go ahead, Joe. I just wanted to thank Lori for the work doing this. Um, you know, I think it's incredibly valuable information for us to realize that, you know, the absolute bare bones model where we tuition our kids and pay the minimum. I mean, I suppose we could take transportation out of this, but realistically, it's going to be a dollar eighty three, no matter what we do. So, you know, looking at all these other options and realizing that, you know, for 17 cents more or, you know, 20 cents more, we can provide so much more. It becomes a much more reasonable con conversation for me as a taxpayer um, and a, a much more defensible position as a board member. It's like, you know, we can, we can give your kids nothing except for a ride on a bus to wherever you want to take them, or you can drive them for a buck 83, or you can keep them in your local school and have that control and have that access and have that input in that programming for 20 cents more. I, I, I really, really think this is valuable and thank you. Welcome. It Thanks, Joe. All right, I've got a number of hands. I'm gonna go Lindsay, Emily, and then Dean. I just wanna reiterate what Joe said that um, this piece of information is just vastly game changing. Um, it's the fact that like we, we, we're still paying a penalty. Like everything about this is crazy. 
and I, it's, I read it earlier and I literally had to walk away and come back because I was like, I can't possibly be, be reading this right. Um, I, I think that it provides a lot of reality to taxpayers to have this information because I think that people think <laughs> that we can get way less. <laughs> um, and look, if we did absolutely nothing, you're still gonna say it's too expensive. I mean, I'm, I'm feeling this big time right now. And um, I just think that having this information, I really appreciate that you did the work for it, Lori, um, and that the budget committee asked for it to get done. Cause I think this is just um, kind of pulls it all together now. <laughs> Yes. Thanks, Lindsay. And Emily? Thank you. Um, so I would just want to cover a couple of things, maybe three things. Following on Lindsay's comments, I think it's important to reiterate the, the challenges around uh, tuitioning and, and the, our inability to control once we have turned over to gone just to tuitioning. And we have examples even in what used to be our own SU where um, we lost one of the school districts who had, who, who went to full tuitioning, Winhall. Um, they they are no longer part of ours, but um, it it was a huge challenge for them. I also want to say because because suddenly everybody wanted to move there because they had full choice, and there's a lot of conversations that can take place around that, and I want people to understand what full choice means. Um, so that leads me to my second point, which you've heard me say before. Choice is such a, um, I'm going to repeat it, sorry if you've all heard it a million times from me, but choice is a wonderful concept, but in reality, everybody doesn't have the same choice, even given choice, to, to make the decisions to go wherever a student chooses to go or a parent chooses to go. You know, unless you're willing to pay transportation and allow parents to have access to, you know, sports and, you know, student teacher conferences, there are folks who are who ha are of less means who are not able to access the choice in the same way other folks are. I want a school that is available for every child equally, an excellent school providing an excellent education. And that's what Lillian Gray has been, and I want to see it continue to be. Um, and I'll just go back to the first comment that Mike made about um, the waiting study. I absolutely agree we need to implement that waiting study in whatever way we can and take off my school board hat for just one sec and put on my <laughs> legislator hat because if every once in a while it does happen that I have to do that. And I just want to say that, you know, the legislature has been consumed by the challenges of COVID. Sure. Um, our, our economy has been pounded as we all know, anyone watching this or listening to this or sitting here in this meeting knows that it has been a super hard challenge for Vermonters to be able to navigate this. That does not minimize the need to implement the waiting study. And I am fully in support of doing that. And I hope we are going to be able to do that. But priorities have to be laid in place by any governing body, including you know the administration and the, and the, the um, legislature to meet the needs of Vermonters in whatever way we can. And we haven't fit anything but COVID in hardly at all, you know, to this point. Now, the legislature is meeting again, coming back into um, session on August 25th. And I, I will continue to fight for what I believe is right, not as a, just as a legislator, but as a school board member, but as a Vermonter, that if children are not being treated equitably across the state, we need to be fighting for making sure they do it. This study, showed that they are not. So I'll continue to fight in whatever way I can to make sure that we implement the recommendations in whatever way we can of the waiting study. Um, and what, you know, I know there's a much broader conversation around that, but I, I still believe it's right. So thanks Mike for bringing it up and we just need to keep as Vermonters fighting for what is right for our kids. Thanks. Thanks Emily. And Dana. I know Lindsay wants to probably talk more about this, but I want to make a motion to take this option off the table. Very. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second that motion. Discussion?
Go ahead, Joe. I I feel like um, this this you know this was never intended as an option as an as an explorer. It, it was purely an intellectual exercise. Yes. To to show us and our our taxpayers what you know what what the real cost is no matter what we do i mean i i think lindsay hit um hinted at it you know i think there are probably people who if you went out and asked them they would firmly believe that we could get that tax rate down to like a dollar 20 and do just fine educating our kids it's it's not true um but so i mean i fully support the motion but i don't think this was ever ever intended as an option it was purely it was. an an you know, it was informational. Yeah. I know, yeah. but I just want to bury it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll help you dig. <laughs> All right, I've got Emily and then Ken. Oh, sorry, I didn't no. lower my hand. That's my fault. Oh, oh, sorry. Ken, was that a raised hand? You're on mute if you're trying yes. to say anything. Yes, okay. it was a raised hand. I'm going to put it down. Um, <laughs> You know, any one of these options can, you know, this is a good point. Uh, Emily, I'm going to get on, on you with this too. That waiting study needs to get pushed forward because Corona, you know, I understand, believe me, I understand the importance of what you guys are doing up there and I really appreciate it. But as far as the taxpayers in these rural towns, this is way long overdue, and you know I've I've had uh, some of my neighbors move just because the taxes are too high, because they're constantly increasing, and we're just going to have a higher cost per pupil if we keep getting less students. Uh, you know, on the upside, uh, I have a son that is trying to move back from Minnesota and he can't because as soon as he looks online for a house, somebody bought it cash because they're, everything's selling so fast. I just wanna know how many of those kids are gonna be enrolled in this district and how fast. But that it's really, really important for that wait, waiting study to go through because I know if it goes through, we're gonna see a reduction in, in the cost per pupil. So I, if you could give somebody a nudge up there, that would, this whole board and all your taxpayers would really appreciate it. I am sure Emily is nudging. <laughs> I have no doubt. A little, a little kick to the shin under the table doesn't hurt either. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mike, you're next. Sure, just to kind of pile on, I agree with what Ken just said, and also I will add on to it. So, you know, since the, uh, our legislature pushed Act 46 on us and we are all here doing it, um, don't they have a responsibility to show us how this is supposed to cost less? They told us it was going to cost less. <laughs> so you know, we're all ears. I'm, I'm waiting to hear from them how, the, how what their vision was for how this was going to cost less. <laughs> That's all right, all. Mike, you, you have made Emily raise her hand. Yeah. <laughs> I'll do it, Mike, because, you know, I was actually, I haven't been on the Ed Committee for a few years, but I was on the Ed Committee when we passed Act 46, and that is just a, a falsehood. We never, ever said it was going to save taxpayers money. We didn't actually anticipate that it would actually save taxpayers money when we wrote that piece of legislation. I think that was added into the conversation later. Um, but it was written to improve educational opportunities for kids. It was driven by in, in, improving educational opportunities for kids. If there were going to be savings, that was going to be up to local districts to find a path for savings. In fact, we encouraged local districts through the legislation to find a path to reduce the spending, but that was gonna be on the local districts to find a way to do that. The driving force for Act 46 was always about educational opportunities because our students were not receiving equal educational opportunities across the state. They still are not, but we, you know, that was the driving force behind it. It was never to, to reduce spending, even though our hope was 
there would be some reduced spending. And I think there has been across the state some reduced spending. It's just that our enrollment has also declined at the same time, which is, you know, exponentially increased our spending. So. Thanks for that clarification, Emily. Yeah. Great, thanks. All right, so we have a motion and a second and plenty of discussion. Is there any further discussion before we, as Dan said, bury this one? Bury it, bury it, bury it. Bury no? it. All right, well, let's do the roll call. We'll start with you, Dana. Bury it. <laughs> I believe that would be otherwise known as? Aye. All right, Aye. thank you. Uh, Lindsay? Aye. Joe? Aye. Keegan? Yes. Ken? You got an eye out of me this time. <laughs> oh. Emily? Aye. Leanne? Aye. Mike? Aye. And Trish? Aye. All right. What is the count on that, Bill? Ten zero. Ten zero in favor. Lori, you are now down to four. <laughs> Scratch that. All right. Not that it was never an option anyway. That was, as everybody says, merely an exercise. Well, it was, it was good data to have, so. Okay, so now we're on to what does it look like um, if nothing changed, right? So we're gonna go out to fiscal year 25. So these are the assumptions that I made. So you're still running three elementaries, one mid-high. Um, same yield threshold equalized pupils. Uh, I've included, included salary and benefit increases, uh, increase in special education, increase in transportation, increase in food service. And then I did put in, um, which I had done back in the, uh, the other scenarios as well. I'm, I'm sort of honing in on some deep, you know, deeper dive assumptions at this point. So we put in, um, a $4 million bond uh, for 30 years, uh, which what came, put a little K next to that 210, because that's $210,000, not $210 um, per year uh, to address the building needs. Um, and then on the other side, I also increased tuition rates. So you're sending towns, um, will pay a little bit more for tuition. Um, I also reduced the number of students uh, that were coming to Leland and Gray to 38. And I've carried that through to fiscal year 25. You know, that is one of the questions. Will that, um, will the number of students coming from sending towns increase? Right now we've seen a decrease. So I wanna make sure that we understand that, you know, between 38 and 40 is right, is really where they're coming in right now. I also reduced the debt services down year over year. Um, with the HVAC being paid off in fiscal year 21. Uh, also the, um, I don't think I have a note on here, but the uh, biomass system will be paid off in fiscal year 25. So it was, or 26, so it was beyond this time frame. So if we look down through, um, if you wanna go up a bit, Joe. Um, this is what the tax rate looks like, and, you know, year after year of increases like this and very little increase to revenue. Um, in fact, a decrease in revenue really for the fiscal year 22 year. So, you know, if, if you do nothing, this is where you could end up in uh, fiscal year 25. This does not address the waiting study. It does not address um, Act 173, those are two important pieces that you need to understand that could affect this greatly in both ways. Does anybody have any questions on this? I'll go ahead, Ken. Lori, great work. Uh, so tell me, uh, in your professional opinion, if this waiting study went through, do you think this graph would uh, stay at this increasing rate? Do you think it would kind of level off or do you think it might even go down? I don't think it would go down, to be honest with you. I, I don't, you know, I can do that for the next time around. 
Um, but the waiting study is not going to be 45 students or equalized pupils, sorry, dropped in in one year, right? It's going to be, most likely it's going to be over a few years that they drop in a certain amount of students. And, but your costs are also increasing, right? So it might be enough to keep up with the cost increases, but you're still, you know, it maybe will flatten the line a little bit. But Bill, jump in and, you know, you want to talk about that a little. Uh, Ken, I was just as curious as you, and so I did my own modeling, but Lori won't let me present it until Lori does it with the real numbers, <laughs> uh, which I think she's very, very smart to do. But um, I would just say that um, when I looked at the options that you guys are looking at now, and I did my own little waiting study is being put in, um, the, the real key is the hinge of FY22. And essentially what happens in almost all the examples I did is that you go up about one to five cents over the course of the next three years if the waiting study as presented gets shared over a three year period. But again, that is bill numbers. That is not the Lori Garland number, but um, it doesn't go down, but it does seem to absorb the natural increases um, that occur on a year to year basis. So that's why that FY22 decision for the board really sets the, well, it's what Lori said at the beginning, you're resetting the educational delivery and you're resetting the tax rate for the future. Um, sorry not to give you too much detail. No, just hearing it would level that down a bit comforts thanks, me. <laughs> thanks, Ken. We've got Emily now. So thanks. And I, I, I mean, I'm hearing everything about the waiting study. I also think that it's worth considering um, that that our that there it needs to be a look at our education funding system more broadly than just the waiting study. And so I would encourage people not to get too hung up on the waiting study and part of the reason why I think there hasn't been a fast quick dive into this um, is partly because I think we we in Vermont do consider that our education funding system which is unique and um, for the vast majority of folks believe that it's um, a, a good system but it's time to take a hard dive and look at it and see whether we can improve. So I think there is no panacea. However, I would just say that what, what would help us, what I've always fought for is to increase our student population. And the way we increase our student population at any school is to provide the best program you possibly can for the students that you serve. And that attracts people to your communities. I mean, you heard people talk about it, me and Lizzie both, about bringing our kids back here because we wanted them to go. There are many people who will go to a school district that has good programs. We just had an exponential decline in student population. We need to make sure that we're the best of the best as we move forward. That's all I'll say about that. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. um, just wanted to pile on that. And so speaking of uh, student decline, Lori, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we're at the bottom and we should actually start seeing uh, equalized pupils start rising. And is that indicated here uh, as to how many students? No, for this modeling, I did keep the students at the same uh, level, the equalized pupils at the five, I think it's 512. Um, we, you are right. The What has been shown in the past is, um, in, you know, a leveling out. I mean, it's a slight rise, um, but again, there's there's so many factors in it. Um, this year will be another data point when we get to the counting of the kids in the fall, um, and we don't know what that's going to look like. And so, I think it's best just to keep it at that 512 for, you know, modeling purposes. Okay, thanks for letting us know that was the assumption. That makes yeah. sense, um, appreciate that. Got Mike and then Dana. 
Sure. Um, yeah, let's hope this is the low. Uh, let's hope there's a COVID related baby boom, but I'm not putting too much faith in that. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, this just reiterates why we're doing this and uh, the long term planning that we're doing as a board and I'm quite alarmed when I look out at 264 and you know 2025. Um, that I think is a complete deal breaker for our taxpayers. <laughs> so we need to figure out, uh, and which is why we're having these conversations. You know how to how do we get this to cost less while still providing substantially the same amount of educational opportunities. So I just wanted to reiterate reiterate that. Thanks, Mike. Go ahead, Dana. I was just going to go on top of what Mike said. Uh, this is going to be a tough sell, you know, for the taxpayers to swallow 227. You look at how many times we've had to revote and chop down. This board is going to have a tough job going forward trying to figure this one out. Um, I know in Jamaica, 227 ain't going to ride. I've heard a lot of grumbling. So, um, you know, their fear of losing their school plus getting a high tax rate, it's gonna cause a rebellion in Jamaica. Thanks, Dana. Lori, so uh, speaking of FY22, so it is, you're showing an 11.24% increase before CLA. Uh, what is the overall, the budget? We, as we all know, that um, isn't always reflected. I would imagine it's a lower percent increase. Oh, you, uh, you're talking about the expenses? Yeah, so I, if, you go, if you go up, um, Joe, I think I have the expenses on there. For the ed spending, is that an 11% increase from 10.7 to 11.4? The tax rate is, um, I have to do the uh, calculation. So if you're talking just at spending, what that increases year over year? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry, yes. As well as the expenses, because yet yeah, also 12 million to 12,580. Right, so the, um, the ed spending is about 6% year over year and then the expense because <clears throat> remember you have to remember the tax rate has the penalty in it so that's why you're so much higher on that right and that you know not saying that we're, we're going with this but that is anything that we have we have to make abundantly clear to folks that uh the majority of the, or at least double the increase is usually due to the, the penalty. Right, so it's about four and a half percent on your expenses. Okay. And because, so fiscal year 22 is also, remember where I took the hit on the tuition students. So your revenue is reduced. So that's why the ed spending is up 6%, where your expenses are only at 4%, which then affects the tax rate because of the penalty being up 11%. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Lori, can I ask you a question? This is Keegan. Is there any way that the, will we always, should we just bank on always having a penalty that we have to pay? Like, is that just like the nature of this particular district and, and our circumstances? Well, would that be a fair all... assumption? Well, we saw in the non-operational, it still produced a, a slight penalty there. Um, the only way to get rid of the penalty is to have your either increase revenues significantly or have your revenues stay the same and decrease expenses. So that's the only way to get rid of the penalty and see what's been happening over the years is your revenue has been decreasing and your expenses have been increasing. So that's the, the gap is what causes the penalty. Does that make sense? It does. Okay. But it, it seems as though if we continue to see declining student enrollment, 
and a pattern year over year over year of increased education costs, mm -hmm. I feel like we're always going to have a penalty. Fair? Fair. Fair, unless you do something to, um, you know, Drastic. <laughs> vastly decrease expenses. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank All right. You. If there's no other questions, you want to move on to the next one? Where? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Emily. All right. I just wanted to make one comment. There is also one other option, which I have been supportive of for many, many years, and that is get rid of the excess spending penalty period. Make it happen. Put it out there. I, I've, been, I've talked about it for years. There have been proposals to do it. I think it's an unfair penalty. Um, school districts try very hard to stay, um, that keep their spending lower. I'm going to continue to fight to get rid of the excess spending penalty. That would Thank be great, Emily. Yeah, there's, there's not another line of business, even loan sharks, that charge 100% penalty. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, yeah. If I just can say, Al, this is about our kids. This is about education. We shouldn't be dealing with a penalty like this. It's wrong. For, for doing the right thing. Yeah. Totally agree. I mean, oh, vo voters, right, ahead, have, voters have the say, right, over whether they want to spend that money or not. That's the point. Voters are the ones who decide. Sorry, I'm on a bandwagon. No, no thanks, Emily. That's a good point. Go ahead, Lori. I just wanted to sort of give Keegan a, a, an example. So. In this, if you look at fiscal year 22 and you look at the um, penalty, it's, um, uh, what is it, 34.73 is the penalty. Um, so you would need to cut to get underneath the threshold in just expenses without touching revenues, with, with keeping revenues the same, right? Um, somewhere in the vicinity of, hold on, I just... Just had the number and then I hit delete by accident. Uh, $1.4 million, right? So if you could shave out of this, these expenses without touching revenues or increasing revenues, it could be a combination of the two, 1.4 million, then you'd be underneath the, the um, threshold. And typically the only way that that, that Mount, that amount of money can be shaved out of a school budget is through the cutting of programs and positions. In closing buildings. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Okay. You know, and if we look back at the, um, you know, tuitioning out, the tuitioning out cut 1.6 million out of expenses, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, 1.4 would be hard to come up with and have any schools and run any type of quality programs. Right. Does that help answer your question a little more? It does. And I think it really speaks to the work that, um, that Emily was talking about, that our, our legislature, we, we need to find a way to, to get them on board with this idea too. So when you're out voting for your fun school budgets, always remember you can vote early and vote often on other things too. <laughs> Thanks, Keegan. I've got Ken and then Mike, and then we'll move on. Uh, yes, Emily, thank you very much for the fight for against the penalty. I agree with you 100%. Um, and as far as uh, my question is with uh, when we do the numbers, throwing this weighting study in, would that eliminate the uh, penalty? Is a very interesting thing to find out. If we run the numbers to find out if the weighting study goes through, that money that because that'll be an extra revenue more or less for the district per pupil that it might just get rid of that uh ex excess uh what do you call it the uh bill's shaking his head no it's not going to get rid of it <laughs> not unless you dropped all 45 students into one year and it would get rid of it for that one year right i mean it might get rid of it but not when they spread it over right 
three years because you're not adding that many students per year. Well, so what are they going to do? If it's 45 students, are they going to add 15 a year? So then technically by the third year, if we are fiscally responsible, we should get rid of it on our own. Uh, if you uh, reduce expenses while you increase equalized pupils, you could be on a pathway to have the penalty come out of the equation, but it's going to take multiple years um, and a very disciplined path. But you're correct, Ken. If you increase pu equalized pupils and you reduce your rate of expense, you have a chance. Hear that, board members? Now you know what to do. Uh, I'm clear. Thanks, Ken. <laughs> All right. Go ahead, Mike. Sure. Um, not to beat a dead horse, but I've mentioned this one a couple of times in previous meetings. Uh, Lori, I know that we have the health and care health care increase. So I'm assuming be based on previous answers that these numbers don't represent the potential because I think our district is looking at a potential up to half a million dollar hit depending on how many uh, employees choose to take that health care. So these numbers here don't include that, do they? They do not. That's, okay. uh, that mainly would hit in the special ed budget, um, <clears throat> which right now it's under reimbursement. So it would be, you know, like a net 250 hit. Uh, but once we go to Act 173, then that would be a full 500,000. So it does not include any of that. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. All right. Want to move on? Yes, please. Okay. Yep. So Thank Joe, you. go ahead and roll her on up. Okay. Perfect. Pathway number three. So basically all of the same uh, assumptions, uh, except for a little less of a small schools grant because there would be one um, elementary uh, eliminated at this point. Um, so there'd be three locations, two elementary, one mid high. And if we want to scroll, so you can uh, see in fiscal year 22, it's at $2.18. So a little bit of a reset there. And those are, you know, the, the assumptions. Uh, the other decreases would be, of course, in um, building costs for one and also um, basically administration and building costs. All right. Ken, is that a, a new hand or an old hand? It was an old hand, but it's a new hand now. Because <laughs> my question is, okay, if we close the school, how long is it going to take for the town to take that school so we do not have the expense of keeping that uh, building up? Because we've gone through this in the past. Uh, many of you weren't on the board at the time, but uh, there are costs in having a building that is that needs to be maintained you can't just shut the water off turn the heat off you still have electric bills phone you have to keep the phone in the building uh you have to you can't just not have a custodian there at all there has to be a part-time custodian there there are costs with a closed building trust me i know newbrook used to be a landlord we used to do it and we had to budget for it so are those costs included in this is my question. Uh, no, no. Okay, raise that tax rate up guys. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks Ken. Any other questions on um, model three? Oh, sorry, Dana, gotcha. Yeah, I was just uh, gonna say the town has to vote to close that. I know we're all looking at Jamaica being this the school that you tend to close. I mean, there is strong opposition to that closing. I and then their tax rates up there, they're not gonna like this, guys. It's gonna be a tough sell. 
I mean, I don't know what to, I'm going to have a hard time selling this to our constituents. Thanks, Dana. And Keegan. So this is kind of going to be my segue into the question that I'm going to propose to Bill. Um, we had talked before about, you know, if you close a school as its function as an elementary school, this still takes into consideration the possibility of repurposing that building to be a target program for those kids that had been tuitioned out um, to go to like special locations like Kern Hatton or um, Kindle Farm. So earlier, um, Lori had mentioned that within these models, there's um, the tuition plus a $7,000 over the top spending piece for students that are, are leaving with an IEP that, that cost, if, I'm, if my notes are right. Would this closure, like two elementary schools and the middle and high school, could that closed building that's no longer functioning as a, a traditional Vermont elementary school somehow be repurposed to bring all of our special ed kiddos that have been tuitioned out to come back in? Or is that not what this means? Uh, just like Ken's question of uh, costs associated with a building that is not currently being operated as a school and those not being baked in this case, any of those possibilities with special education repurposing is not baked into the cake because we don't know if it's possible. And so we don't wanna have false reality. We wanna have consistent, this is what it looks like when you just operate two buildings. Ken is correct. There's probably some costs in there that we'd have to account for. There might be some savings to account for. But what you're talking about is a possibility and something that we'd really like to, to dive into. But the reality is that would be, that couldn't happen at the exact same time. You'd need some time to plan it. You need some time to recruit the students from other SUs. You need to build up a program. Um, very possible, but not in this model. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Katie. All right, any other questions on, uh, on this one? All right, let's move on to uh, I 11. have a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Ken. That's okay. I, I know you thought I left it up. Uh, <laughs> with, in regards to doing, repurposing a building for just special ed students, whatever happened to students being mostly inclusive in classrooms unless they have to have special instruction? Unless we're talking about, uh, special ed students that uh, could not function in a regular classroom setting, I don't think you could structure a whole school based on special ed needs when uh, special ed says you have to be, uh, have kids included into regular classrooms as much as possible. Which is something yeah, that's that... an excellent point. Um, it basically it falls on an entire continuum, and um, it, it happens right now where uh, students that you cannot serve within your uh, regular school buildings, uh, right. we tuition them out to specialty programs. And what Keegan's talking about is if we had an empty building, we could replicate what we are currently sending out. And it could be a variety of things. It could be one that uh, is integrated into another school. It could be one that is a separate school in and of itself. That's why I'm saying that we didn't bake any of that into this cake because it would, it would take some time to actually figure out what it's gonna be and then build something like that. Up. Exactly, and it's not that I'm, I'm against anything like that. Because, you know, if it's beneficial for our students to be closer to home, and beneficial to other students and build a program, I think it would be fantastic. But, you know, what's the viability? Can we do it and how long would it take? I think, those are uh, well, questions. I think that's a question that the board is probably gonna want us to uh, dive into a little deeper um, on these models. Could I make a motion at this point that the 
I would just wait, wait, yeah, wait until the... <laughs> Lori finishes, and then you can do. <laughs> yes, let's I will, do that. I, I make a motion to for me to wait. <laughs> That's a great motion. Excellent. All right. Uh, I see Lindsay, and then Keegan. Is that another hand? No. Okay. I'm sorry, Lindsay. Then. <laughs> um, it it could possibly wait until we have this further discussion when Lori's done. But I'm curious. Um, how much of that special ed budget, and this may not be something that you can even tell me, but how much of that special ed budget is currently kids that we are sending out within our current system? I don't know what he's saying. <laughs> I think Bill's saying, speaking, but. <laughs> uh, I think what Lindsay's asking is out of the uh, $6 million special ed budget for the SU, how many uh, students in West River um, constitute a cost that our students that are not being served within our system? And uh, the answer to that is with transportation around a million dollars. So yes, there's definitely could be some cost savings that would offset keeping a building running. Right. So. Wow. Yes. It's possibilities. Okay. I've got uh, Dana and Emily. Yeah, I was just wondering, Bill, um, would this be a force them to go to this school or would they, would we be on a wait and see if they want to come back? Uh, it would be part, so students, um, placement of students occurs in an individual education planning meeting of which the individual education planning team makes a recommendation for the best placement for a student. So. That is a process of which uh, it is federally protected. And um, the director of special education has the final say as the uh, local education association representative of where the team lands on where the best place for a student to go is. So I, as the superintendent, cannot intercede within that federally mandated process. Um, but I would say that um, almost all the time, the team comes to a conclusion that is always in the best interest of the student and is supported by the director of special education. Thank you for that answer. Emily. Thanks. Uh, just quickly, Bill and Lori, if there were a potential for a program in a school um, in one of our buildings, whether it's in a closed building or whether it's within integrated within one of our buildings. Is that something that you anticipate we could take in tuition students from other, whether they're in Wyndham Central or outside of Wyndham Central? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Ken, are you taking yourself self out of the, uh, the waiting? Uh, no, well, this has to do with the uh, Dana's question. Uh, and Bill's answer, he's very correct. And the, I have seen in the past where the uh, director of special education opted to have a student go to another district on the advice of the IEP team. So it's, it, it's really a, a great, when you, that, those IEP teams are really great. The parents have weight. The uh, administration has some weight and it's all about what's best for each individual child. And personally, I think every kid should be on an IEP because they get a lot more of individual personalized education. <laughs> but it's really great. It really is. It's they, the teams, they, they work together, fantastic. And it's all about what, what each kid needs. And so, my hat's off to the special ed people in our district because they do a fantastic job. Thanks, Ken. Um, I think I see Mike. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think we kind of, this is kind of a segue as we've been segued already. Um, it sounds like this is something that we should include in our, you know, planning as a potential option. Okay. Great. Yep. Um, it is one of them right now. And 
Uh, I think uh, probably alluding to what Bill said, uh, let's let's have Lori finish out the, I think it, we're on to the last one. Is that the last we, one? We are. And, and then maybe we can. Well, it, it wasn't, it was, I mean, I was talking about like having our own special ed school, right? Or program. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's not actually under consideration right now. I don't think. You cannot do that until Lori's done. <laughs> Ken has already All right. set his placeholder to make that motion. All right, I'm, I'm, <laughs> waiting, I'm waiting for Lori and Ken. Okay, so, so am I good to go? Yes, thanks, Lori. <laughs> okay. All right, so just cross off three locations. I, I realized I copied and pasted my assumptions from the previous one. So this would be one elementary and one mid-high. And, and it's two locations. So I'll uh, change that and we'll re-upload for the public that correct um, modeling. <clears throat> all the other things are the same, though. The, the um, assumptions are the same. So did everybody get that? Two locations, one elementary, one mid-high. Okay, I don't think, it's a PDF, so I don't know if you can change it. But. I thought, Laurie, I thought 11 was one elementary, one mid-high. Yes, two locations, one elementary, one mid-high. Yes. <laughs> okay. <You're adjusted. laughs> Thank you, sorry. I just, I copied and pasted and didn't catch that edit. All right, so let's uh, scroll down and we'll take a look at this. So it's all the same assumptions, but it is um, closing two elementaries. Uh, and so that involves the, um, basically the building operations for both and the administration for both. Okay, it doesn't, it doesn't reduce um, staffing significantly as far as teachers are concerned. Um, I think we had three less FTEs for teachers. Um, okay, so that gets it at 205. So it flattens your curve, as we've been hearing a lot of flattening the curve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, does anybody have any questions on this? Again, Ken, it doesn't involve keeping the buildings, you know, operating or anything like that. It does not involve any special ed um, programs. And it doesn't really take into consideration moving the SU um, to one of these empty buildings either. So at this point in time, that's the next deeper dive. Okay, my comment, Lori, on this is gonna be pretty simple is if you're talking about flattening the curve, when is the second wave going to come and hit us? Can you predict that? <laughs> no. <laughs> Straight up no. All right. So if we want to just go down to the, if there's no questions, then if we want to move down to the graph to kind of pull it all into, you know, one graph that says, okay, you're at fiscal year 21, 204. We looked at the floor, which was the non-operational at $1.83. And then the next um, one, two, three, four uh, pieces of the graph are, if nothing changed, how would this step up? And then fiscal year 22, path number three, and fiscal year 22, path 11 and how it all stacks up. Does this graph make sense to everybody as to how, how this looks? Yes. Okay. Um, can I emphasize your note down below? That would be great. So I think it's really important. So trying to connect the beginning of what Lori talked about to the end here. The beginning talked about resetting the foundational tax rate while delivering high quality education to your citizens and students. And then it's important to know that we're kind of living in a false reality up until FY24. Different towns are treated differently from the hold harmless. Everybody is treated differently because we are stepping down from eight, six, four, and two. 
All of that goes away when you guys build the FY24 budget. And everybody is at the unified tax rate. So just for a thought experiment, imagine you live in Brookline, Leanne, and you're paying $1.789 this year on a budget that you just passed. Well, in three years, you're going to be at the unified tax rate. You're going to have the hold harmless taken away. And then you're going to pay whatever happens over the next three years on that day. So you can imagine, as you were pointing out, Dana, earlier, that if we stay on the same trajectory of operating everything we're operating, somebody from Brookline would go from $1.78 to $2.67. So it's just important to understand the magnitude of the decisions you guys are making. And I just wanted to point that out. Yeah, we're already there at the unified tax rate and it's going up and up and up. I can understand Brookline being at the lower end going up drastically in one year. Right. And, uh, like I have a very important question to ask here with this option here with the one elementary school, and that is, do we have an existing building large enough to base all our elementary school kids in? So I believe it's optional. Oh, sorry. Can I answer him? <laughs> Please. Um, option 11, it was splitting. It was, I think, pre-K through three um, or two, pre-K through two um, in Townsend, and then three through 12 at Leland and Gray was how the split was. So we're, I have to point this out to the board. We had a lot of issues from uh, family members worrying about putting fifth graders in with 17, 18 year olds in the same building. And now you were, we're thinking about putting in uh, third graders into the same building. Is this a can of worms that we really want to open up to save a couple of dollars. Thanks, Ken. Also, also, also piggybacking on that is, and all this so ties in with this covert conversation, the co you know, the COVID conversation, which we're gonna have next anyway. So can we segue in there, please? Thank you, Laurie, it's all good stuff. <laughs> which okay, well. poses many, many, many conundrums. All right, Keegan, and then back to Lori, unless Lori had a, a response. No. Okay. I just, I just wanted to take a quick second and respond to Ken's question and concern around having um, third graders or underclassmen in with uh, secondary level students. I currently teach in a pre-K through 12 building and the opportunities for community development from a four-year-old to a student who's 18 is really amazing. Um, there's 600 people in the entire structure, in the entire building, and we're all housed together. And I, I would say that it's probably brought the, whatever apprehension could have existed, with, at least in the community that I teach in, um, it went away as soon as parents and community members realized just how good it is to have children intermixing and from a young kid to see the graduating seniors walking through the hallways or for a middle school student to have a beautiful exchange as a reading buddy to an underclassman who's in like second or third grade. So just because people don't want it, they might not know what it is that they don't want. They probably are imagining a worst case scenario, but you got to have a little bit of heart and recognize that these are 600 kids and what beautiful opportunities you can create for them if they are all in the same building together. So geography shouldn't be something that's so scary that pushes an idea away. Just my own opinion, working in a pre-K through 12 building for the last six years. 
Thanks, Keegan. Go ahead, Lori. Um, I just wanted to finish up so that we can, uh, you know, keep moving on because I just wanted to point out there's some variables here and you can all read through them. I don't need to go through them. We've talked about a lot of them, but I also wanted to point out the board reflections. So there's links here to a pro con, um, you know, and I think as you think through, you've mentioned some of them, um, but not every voice is heard necessarily. Um, and as you think through them and decide, you know, what is a pro to pathway three? What is a con to pathway three? So provided a, um, it's a, a form uh, with five pros, five cons, and then a place to, to put any comments. Um, we don't have to do the pro con on the non-operational because you kick that one to the curb. So <laughs> no problem there, but, um, should oh I think I did the sharing right but if not I can go back in and do it you're not able to open it Joe no it says I need permission it can only be viewed by users in the owners organization okay I'll go through and um, redo that I thought I had done the permissions right but I'll go through and redo the permissions on those but just for the board to, to put down some of their reflections of you know some of the voices that may not always be heard um, this is really important you guys so what we have learned through this process you know we're trying to model uh, what we do with uh, our students and our colleagues every day is we have learned that it's really important for all 11 of you to have an opportunity to share your thoughts and not everybody, just like we differentiate learning, not everybody is, uh, you know, the outward speaker at public meetings, but we still need your voice heard. And so uh, we really want to hear from you. Um, Lori will give you permission, but this is just for the 11 of you to, to, to feed into this so that the budget committee on the 27th has some information from all of you about your thoughts on the pros and cons of those three options. So please. And I'll remind you, but please put your, put your thoughts there because it's going to be important for the budget committee to look at it. And then we're going to bring it back to you all in the tent. I lost you. Al, you muted yourself. Sorry about that. <laughs> my son was yelling at me from outside. I had to mute myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, all right. I don't see any other hands. So I think that's great. Uh, Lori, appreciate it. Uh, Bill, great idea. So we'll all put our thoughts into the pros and cons. And uh, that way the budget committee will have plenty to work with. Uh, at the next meeting on July 27th. Excellent. Um, all right, I think that wraps up that section. And then we can move on to contracts. And I think we're- Well, getting... Ken. Oh, I'm sorry. You waited patiently. I apologize, Ken, now's your moment. Okay, now I don't think I'm gonna make a motion here, but are we gonna talk about COVID before we move out of this into no the, the, no i know no i i'd like to point something out to this board i don't know i mean everybody we we have a very unique situation here well we're not it's it's a worldwide it's not unique everybody has it uh, but it, just to keep us all aware of we're all talking about throwing more people in buildings and crowding our students right now at this point in time, our individual small schools right now are the barrier between having an outbreak and another uh, educational pandemic. So, I, it, you know, statewide, we have 14 counties. Obviously, the populations vary, and you can, uh, but just to let you know, the second highest per person um, county as of Friday 
was Wyndham County. One in every 431 people are on track, or are, are currently right now have COVID in this county, which is the second highest in the state. Of course, Chittenden County takes number one spot there and they can have it. Um, just to let you know that out of 14 counties, okay? So uh, seriously, we really need to think about when we go back to school, I saying to the board and to the administration, we re really seriously need to have a plan, not wait for the Department of Ed to say, well, this is, we're gonna kind of go this way. We need to be upfront and say that we need to put our parents, our children at ease before the school year starts. Can we do something at our meetings to show what kind of preemptive steps we're taking, what kind of, I don't wanna say school closure because it gets a lot of people angry, uh, you know, or remote learning or whatever plans we have. If it's in a classroom, will that class be, you know, if one kid's family comes down with it and you know, you gotta do your contact tracing, does that class get isolated from the rest of the building? How are we gonna go about this? We need answers as parents, as board members, as community members. What are we gonna do? And actually, I thought you were gonna talk about repurposing the special ed buildings. We'll talk about the COVID, but we got these two business things to do. And then I will okay. answer your question. I don't even wanna to go to that expense, Bill. I'm just hoping that the revenue outweighs the cost and we make a fine financial and well educate, educational serving decision if it comes to that. Okay, Ken, so you didn't want to talk about, all right, we'll, we'll move on then. All right, Lindsay. I would like Bill <laughs> to come up with some idea for a special ed program and how that may counteract all of the rest of these expenses and what that might look like and what it might mean. I'll second that motion. I'll take my hand down. <laughs> <laughs> Discussion. All right, seeing none, roll call. Start with you, Dana. Aye. Lindsay. Aye. Keegan. Aye. Ken. Aye. Joe. Aye. Emily. Aye. Leanne. Aye. Mike. Aye. Trish. Aye. All right. Unanimous. Is that 10? All right. Thank you. Thanks, Lindsay. Appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Great. All right. Now, are we able? Ken, is that a new hand? Yes, that's a new hand. Sorry. Uh, quick question. This goes back. This goes back to the next school year. Um, can Can you waiting? table that? Because I believe after we talked contracts and food service, we had said at the beginning of the meeting that we would discuss uh, what the new year after that. So it's already slotted. So let's um, let's take care of the next two items. Well, it has to do with something that's going on right now, which is the engineering report. Okay. But I'll wait. Okay, thank you. All right, contracts. Bill, did you want to speak to that? The yes, we have one uh, new hire um, that we need to approve. Um, is our Spanish teacher at the high school? And um, it is for $75,675 um, for Mr. Aaron Dringus. And I need the board to make a motion to allow the chair to sign the contract. So moved. Second? Seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Dana? Aye. Lindsay. Aye. Keegan. Aye. Ken. 
D. Pardon me? It's appropriate. It's Spanish. C. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> All right, Joe. Aye. Emily. Aye. Leanne. Aye. Mike. Aye. Trish. Aye. All right, motion carries. I will sign that for you, Bill, and be back to you promptly tomorrow. And then uh, Lori's just going to give you a quick little rundown, 60 seconds, 90 seconds. You guys have all the documents, but we just wanted to update you on the food service program. Right. I just wanted to make sure that you had this information um, as well, because we had talked about, um, you know, the food program losing money and, uh, you know, the whole board came out in, in support of the provision to and universal meals. So I just wanted you to know, we've been working with uh, Food Connects. Uh, we have a relationship with them. And basically Connor over there uh, put this document together as to a plan to increase the amount of applications that we uh, get in, uh, particularly at Leland and Gray. So I just wanted you all to be aware of what it's going on behind the scenes, so to speak. Thanks, Lori. Is there anything in particular, maybe Dana will ask this as well, but uh, I see that Townsend, well, all the elementary schools have a very high rate of uh, return. Yes. Uh, great. Uh, hoping that some of these will change that, or what, what in particular were the elementary schools doing? I'm not exactly sure why necessarily, um, except that they're smaller and that, you know, um, they're used to doing it. And at Leland and Gray, they're just there. The participation in applications has always been low, but it's, it's very critical in provision two to get those applications in. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to commend the plan. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I do. I think our elementary school administration and staff really get to the parents on getting these things filled out. So I do believe it's their dedication and perseverance to get to the parents to fill these out. I know it might be a matter of pride for some people not to fill them out. I like this plan that I've read it and I think it's very good and it will I think if we get the Leland and Gray more participation from them then we'll be able to hit our mark. All right, thanks. All right, no other questions. Now we can move on to the new year. So why don't I give uh, a little update and then uh, go ahead and pepper me with questions, but let's let Lori go to sleep. Thank you, Lori. Thank Appreciate you so it. Much, Lori. Awesome job. Um, so the leadership team, which is your uh, central office and your principals have been working on um, getting back to school since about April. And uh, we have focused on the things that we, the known knowns. So we know the environment that we need to create in the buildings for our students to return and for our staff to return safely and to have a healthy, strong start. So I will again credit uh, the WCSU board, which you guys are the dominant members of, for approving the director of operations because if we did not have a director of operations during this time. Uh, I literally have no idea what would be going on. And I think your principals would uh, be having nervous breakdowns. But because you guys were so prescient, we are really well prepared. And uh, we're so well prepared in the sense that we are one of uh, only two uh, SUs below Route 4 that are running uh, multiple summer programs in which we are practicing all of the protocols, um, which has been invaluable to learn with real students from grades kindergarten through eight, uh, what really works, what spacing works, 
What does it mean when you have physical distancing, when it's recommended to be six feet, but they want it to be between three and six feet? What does that actually look like in a classroom? What does passing in the hallways look like? What does it look like going to the bathroom? What does it look like dropping people off? What does it look like asking the four questions? What does it look like riding a bus? What does a bus monitor do? Um, a thousand questions that we would have had in, in August, we are now getting a ton of answers to. Um, I will give an, an enormous amount of credit to uh, Johanna liskowski Doak and uh, Kylie Boyd, who are running those two programs at the uh, Newfane campus, Newbrook campus, and uh, Leland and Gray. Um, it's just been a huge advantage for us um, to be able to see the kinds of things that we're going to need to put in place. Um, and then we're going to show up when school starts and we're going to have to learn a whole nother thing because something new will come down. And just like Ken said, uh, what do you do when the second grader uh, comes back from the weekend and their uncle visited and they find out that they may have been exposed? Luckily, the Department of Health is working on a matrix that we're supposed to see on the 20th that answers literally like 55 of those questions. Well, 55 is good because it gets us to the 120 that we're gonna have to try to answer. But really what we're trying to do is set the physical environment to be as safe as possible with the realization that it's a pandemic and it's never gonna be perfect. And then on Wednesday, we're supposed to get the guidelines for what we can do to offer remote learning. And so once we have the rules of that game, we are estimating that there could be anywhere between 10 and 20, maybe even 25% of our parents that are just not comfortable sending their kids back to school when it starts, no matter all the things that we put in place. And I think Lindsay pointed out last time, that's an enormous revenue chunk that not only do we want to provide service to our community, but we also don't want to lose the ADM cap. So we need to know the rules of what that means to offer remote learning because we have to figure out how that's gonna look. Because if I'm a second grade teacher and I've got 18 kids in my class and I've got five, they're at home, who's responsible for those five kids learning? And who's responsible for the 13 are in class? And can one teacher do that? Can we set a schedule that will allow that? Can we not have school on Wednesdays? Can we not have school on Fridays? Can we do A, B schedules? Um, one thing that we've learned from the Leland and Gray experience this summer is middle school kids are big and they bump into each other a lot. And um, they're actually really good about wearing masks and they really don't have a problem with it. They just view it as another school rule. Um, but we have to be unbelievably flexible. So here's what we're doing. Uh, the leadership team has been meeting for three months and tomorrow we have our set, well, no, let's see, our fifth meeting with the teachers. So the union representative have three people that come to our meetings. And we are going through, I asked the uh, Teachers Association to provide questions. They gave me seven pages of questions. And um, we are going over five, discussing those tomorrow. Uh, the other six pages I am answering, a lot of them are very technical, a lot about the contracts and how we're gonna um, approach certain scenarios, kind of like what Ken said. Um, and so we are going to be beginning to plan how could it look when school starts? How does it look for a teacher? How does it look for a parent? How does it look for students? And then we're going to add in the rules of the remote learning in the middle of the week. Um, so we have set up four meetings in the next 12 days where we're going to be kind of detailing out all that work. Our goal is by August 1st, to let the community know this is where we're at in the plan. It would be awesome to be able to tell them this is exactly what it's gonna look like, but I can't promise that because things change so rapidly. And then to update them weekly from that point on. So you can imagine August 1st, this is where we're at, August 8th. On the 10th, you guys have a meeting, I'll give you a full deployment of where we're at. Again, we'll do it on the 15th. Again, we'll do it on the 22nd. And then we're gonna come when school starts. Really, August is gonna be our giant communication time because I think we're gonna actually have enough of planning and enough information that we're not gonna freak people out, but we can let them know what to think about, 
so that they can make their own decisions for their kids. We have developed a survey that we're gonna be sending out to families so we can get an idea of whether that 10 to 25% is accurate or not. Um, it's gonna be really important for us to understand transportation. But in general, where we are right now with the state is we are opening in what is called step two or stage two, which is the default is kids in the building as much as possible following all the CDC, AOE, DOH guidelines. And so that's what we're preparing for. And then we're gonna to have to react to the realities of, yeah, we thought we could do it, but we just can't have that many kids in the middle high school. And so we're gonna to have to look at two or three different options, and then we're gonna to have to figure out what is the best for the students. Um, Ken is correct. We are very fortunate that we run three elementary schools where we have our 220 kids spread out. Um, so that adds us a little flexibility in spacing and organization. I will say that the lessons that we're learning this summer are, are really invaluable because of the people that are gonna be deploying them uh, when the school starts as well. We've already had principals come from other schools to come and watch the protocols so they can actually see them. Um, so I kind of rambled on, but I just wanted to give you, that's a baseline. That's what we're planning on doing. Wow, thanks Bill, appreciate it. Ken. Thank you, Bill. I, know you, I knew you had a handle on it, but I just figured the question had to be asked. Oh yeah. Of, you know, I'm, and I've been, I, I'm not that far from Newbrook and I do event once in a while, go over and sit up in the upper parking lot there and watch them out in the field. And it's really something to see. So thank you very much. But, and I one more question being, we're sending all the kids back to school, which is great. Um, my question is, uh, it would have been, is Mr. Medina on tonight? Probably not. Yes. No, no, he's sleeping. He's sleeping. Okay. <laughs> then you can wake him up with this question tomorrow is, uh, we went over this thing where it's, it's the structurally sound Leland and gray. So uh, the official one is coming on the 20th, the preliminary report, so just the oral report. Um, it appears not bad. Okay. Very and excited about not bad. I, I like not bad myself, but are, you know, is there going to be some kind of guarantee that the building is not going to, these engineers going to give us a guarantee the building is not going to fall in on our kids? An engineer is not going to give you any guarantee. They're just going to give you data. Oh, and then they're going to give you, this is what we think the data tells us, and this is what we recommend you do. That's why that $4 million is built into all the options. Okay. Sounds like a plan. The budget committee should have the report on the 27th. So. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Go ahead, Dana. You going to do what I think you're going to do? Uh, I was gonna no. I was gonna ask Bill. Uh, did uh, any of us volunteer for the governor's task force to provide guidance? Since I have not been informed if any of you have volunteered <laughs> for the governor's task force, um, we are was... unbelievably fortunate that Bob Tebow, who is your principal at Leland and Gray, is also the executive director of the Vermont Principals Association, and he is one of five people that gets to meet every single Friday for two hours with the Secretary of Ed, the Director of the Vermont Superintendents Association, the Director of the Vermont Teachers Association, and uh, the Vermont Department of Health. Those five people meet every Friday for two hours. So wow. we get to hear everything before everybody else does. And Bob does a phenomenal job of advocating for what is best for kids. So we're I feel very comfortable that we're gonna create an environment and we can communicate that environment. And then we'll have parents be knowledgeable about deciding whether or not they wanna participate in that environment. Um, we're just trying to make it safe for staff and we're trying to make it safe for kids. And, and then people can make their own choice. I, I, I've seen stuff on social media, you know, that teacher out west that died and, and other, you know, and some local, 
people are showing concerns yeah. that we, you know, maybe we, you know, hopefully by August we'll have a good plan out there, some transparency, and it'll leave some of the anxiety that's building up. There's an enormous amount of anxiety, Dana. You're right. And I think we're going to build the best plan we can. We're going to communicate it transparently. And then we're going to be ready to change because we just don't know how it's going to play out. And we have to be flexible. And I, I got to tell you, I mean, the, um, the partnership that you all have with your teachers is enormous. Um, they are so willing to be creative and flexible and thoughtful and um, they are nothing but student-centered and um, without their partnership we couldn't even engage in these conversations about what we're going to do and um, I mean they showed it in the final 13 weeks of the year it was a no-brainer and uh, it was outstanding but it has continued through their leadership and their conversations with us they're simply trying to find a safe and healthy way for students to return to school and return to instruction whatever that means. It's, it's been a wonderful partnership. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I've got Emily and then Joe. Um, so I don't want to jump Joe on this, so maybe I'll only do the one thing. Bill, you mentioned that Bob is executive director. He's not, he's president, correct? Oh, sorry, he's the president. I just want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're labeling him accurately. And my I was going to actually ask Al if there was a, if this was time to make a motion to adjourn, but I'm not going to do that if Joe's up. So he's up next. Oh, I think Joe, <laughs> I think Joe was all over oh, that. Joe, so Joe, saying, maybe that's like Joe's hand. Well, if yes, that's, that's why my hand was up too. Then, I, then you can second it for me. And I was just going to say, this is a late one. I'll make a motion to adjourn if we're done. All right. I'll second, second it. All right. Dana. Aye. Ken. Aye. Joe. Aye. Emily. Aye. Leanne. Mike. Aye. Egan. The conversation is just getting good. Al, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're the host. You can kick her out. <laughs> Mute. Aye. <laughs> Lindsay. <laughs> what was that, Lindsay? Aye. And Trish. Aye. We have adjourned. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.